Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. Backstory, I started using drugs in 2015 and figured out that if I sold my body I could make easy money. I know not ideal but I was deep in addiction and at that point I didn't care about anything. But in January 2017 I met Tyler who also smoked with me but worked every day so I no longer had to do that. I was going on like 8 months free from selling my body and soul. When I met Tyler he had a place in this big city and he did a lot of work for people in this city. I was left on the street by the man I thought I had loved at the time. I must have said something wrong because he flipped out and left with everything I owned in his truck. We just spent days getting high and I was sure he was just throwing a fit so I went over to my friends. Let's call him Edward. He was my home away from home and I felt safe there. Edward was an older maybe 60 year old man who liked to get high and over time he became one of my best friends. I was able to take a shower and put on clean clothes. When I was all done I remember sitting on the couch with disbelief that Tyler would leave me like that. I started crying and wishing things had been different while Edward held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start to depend on myself and live a happy life. Across the street from Edward's house was a hometown bar where rappers and Mussians would perfect and on that particular night the bar had been filled with people from the bigger city about a half an hour away. Let me explain, where I come from there isn't really a place for addicts to go and get clean. They do have a women's shelter which I have been to before. About 30 minutes away is a bigger city where they have all the help you can ask for if you are willing to do the work. At this point I was ready to get away from everyone and everything. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere close to where I was using. Remember you have to remove all playmates, playthings, and playgrounds so that's what I needed to do. I went right over to that bar and found a semi good looking guy heading back to the city I needed to go. I told him I had planned to go to the shelter in the morning and he told me I could just go home with him and he will take me in the morning. On the ride I remember feeling like a whole 100 bricks was lifted off of my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and a phone with no minutes. I asked the guy I was with that what he was driving had pretty sweet ride. I said you don't screw with this right and I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head so I rolled down the window and just let it go. I knew that going into this shelter I had to get better, not just for me but I had kids and a family that at that time still hoped I would get better. I wanted to start over, I just didn't know how hard it was going to be. Lee and this random dude go to his friend's house, we smoke a blunt and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room, I meet clean there was nothing in it. It smelled like paint as I looked around I realized this was the place the dude was talking about moving into and renting. I got up and he took me to get a coffee and right over to the shelter. I was really terrified of what I was walking into. I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was I needed to better my life and I needed to do it now. As we drove into downtown, I got a little nervous because I knew downtown was full of crime and drug dealers. Big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people and traffic. I then realized I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back. We pulled onto the street and before I knew it, he was dropping me off. There I was standing in this big beautiful clean lobby just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Tyler for almost 7 months and this was the first time he left me like this so I was kind of hurt over that. I knew he had been seeing someone else in our recent month breakup and he wasn't afraid to show it. It smelled like lime with spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk and I was asked if I was homeless. Yes I said and she didn't even ask any questions. She just looked at me with sad eyes and said okay let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes as she hands me one. She explained it was for my personal things. I looked at her with unsettling eyes and replied that I didn't have any belongings. That I had lost everything the night before. The nice lady gave me some toiletries and a pair of leggings. Next was the intake where I had to answer a bunch of questions and was handed a paper with all the rules on it and on the top of the paper it stated there was no internet in or around the building. You had to go down to the stop sign to get internet. I knew Tyler was already probably staying with that other girl. Michelle was her name so I didn't feel it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut off everyone and try to be different. When she was done giving me the rundown on how things worked, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird and I remember feeling sick going through the double doors with stairs off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats. I was told to grab one. I followed her through another set of double doors into the day room which was huge. It was filled with at least 50 women, a lot of older ladies with nowhere to go but it was loud and bright. The wall to my left was full of lockers which I was told I would get one if I stayed there long enough and in front of that wall was about 10 or 15 round tables set up where most of the girls were sitting playing cards, coloring, and talking. On the other side of the room was the shower and bathroom and 
and a small television that sat on a cart with wheels on it next to the cart was the end table that had an electrical strip full of chargers and phones. In the far back right corner was a door that lead outside to go smoke. It was nice there was picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fenced in yard for the kids to play in. When 7 at night hit the whole dynamic of the room changed, everyone was moving around, people were running in and then you hear over the speaker roll call. Then we were instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on. They passed out blankets and pillows to those who were without them and they let us keep the television on. The first night was scary and lonely. Here I was in a strange place not even two full days clean off a week long crack binge. I was up half of the night with my head just racing. I finally fell asleep when the other girls started to get quiet. The morning came way too fast and the rule was you had to get up at 7 in the morning. You didn't have to leave but you had to get up. A lot of the older ladies didn't even leave the shelter. They knew they had a place to stay and had nothing else to do all day so they hung out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast food person but that morning I was starving. I had the whole deal eggs, bacon, milk. After breakfast I went out to smoke and I noticed this tiny black girl with cornrows in her hair had some cards in her back pocket. I had been playing cards since I was a kid. My dad taught me a few games. I played with friends and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was lowly. I didn't know where anything was and it was obvious I needed help. I asked her for her name and if she wanted to play cards and after two games we had a connection. She was cool and she liked me so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around new people and women tend to not like me so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. She asked me after we played a few more games of cards if I wanted to go to McDonald's with her. I was cool with that because I needed to learn the area anyway. On the walk there as we were talking something caught my eye so I looked up and there he was, Tyler, with all of my belongings in his truck drives right by us. I tried to call but he ignored me every time. Guess he was done with me for good this time. That crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink until I disappeared but instead I had about 10 different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he was just looking for a reason to leave me since the month before when we broke up and I stayed with my dad for a while. He started seeing this Michelle. I was just absolutely devastated. We continued our walk to McDonald's as I was silent and broken. That night was easier to sleep because I was exhausted from not having any sleep and just feeling done. I slept like a baby to be honest. The next day my new friend wanted to show me this place she goes to get a good free lunch. The only thing was it was a church and we had to sit through a 30 minute sermon which was cool with me. We were standing outside waiting on the church to open their doors and this blacked out Mercedes Benz with a trailer hauling a nice looking Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say that's a nice setup. I looked at my friend and then looked back at the Harley. That's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. William is what they called him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and be a part of a new community. Everyone was really nice going into the church. A guy at the door walking and gave us a pamphlet of meal times and services offered. I followed my friend to one of the back pews and slid in behind her. The church was pretty, different colors everywhere and there was a choir singing in a low and almost quiet tone as people around Around us taking their seats. I kind of froze when that guy I saw come in. William sat next to me. I looked at my friend and then I quickly noticed his gold watch. It could have been fake but it almost looked like a Rolex. He was an older black gentleman, talked real smooth when he introduced himself with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand. No one in my life does that so I shook his hand. He was nice dressed and had this hat on like a fedora. It even had a feather in it. His collar was strong but smelled good like a man. He was handsome and smooth. He was also very confident. Sitting through this sermon I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher. I remember looking at his clean, shiny black leather shoes and the socks were black and thick. When the service was finally over people started heading into the dining area. I just followed my friend through and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat on one of the ends of the long tables full of chairs. Not even five minutes, not paying attention to our surroundings, just eating. William came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at my friend and said do you mind? I don't know why I didn't see the red flags. Of course I see them now but looking back I was so clueless. He hardly said a word the whole time we were eating and when he was done he got up threw his stuff away and I assumed he left. My friend and I decided to go home and play some cards and go to a closed bank she knew about. We were walking home and talking when William pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window and he asked if we needed a ride home but he was looking at me with a deep stare. I looked back at my friend and she refused. Smart girl and I went with him. Dumb girl. I think I I was more curious than anything. I had to know how he made that kind of money and I remember wanting that. We drove around until my curfew and just talked. I don't know what it was. I think we had a lot in common and we related a lot. He asked me how I ended up at this shelter and just asked questions so I told him. I don't know what it was. I am not sure if I trusted him but I told him about my past anyway. How I sold my body for drugs and how horrible it was and I even said I was glad I didn't do it anymore. He didn't say much about it and we agreed that we would continue our talk the next day and he would help me put in a couple applications 
and he had some errands too. I woke up in the morning to a text from William that said what if you made that kind of money but spent it on yourself, not trucks. Everything you make will go to you building your life. Just think about it. I thought about it and not going to say why I agreed and went with the idea that this would work and I could actually get my life together and get my kids back. $200 every half hour. I could be free. I chose to go with him. At that time I think he thought I wanted to be with him but really I just wanted a way out of the situation I was in. I hated that stinky loud shelter. I wanted out. He got a rook at a motel and we dropped off my stuff and he told me that I needed some new clothes. He did tell you that he was just fired from a trucking company. He was a truck driver. He was currently trying to find another job as far as I knew. He took me shopping and got me a few new outfits, more or less outfits to take pictures and to bring the money. I knew what I was getting into and I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. William did tell me that if I went with him I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back at how manipulative he was it made me believe that I would do this to make my life better. We get back to the hotel and I do my thing, take my pictures and post them. It didn't take long before I started to get calls. I did make some money and I kept every penny and William took me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought. They were black and gold. I love those shoes. I got like six or seven cute outfits, some makeup and hair dye. Remember I came to the shelter with nothing so being able to get all this stuff made me feel so good. I was confident in myself and hopeful that I could get a place and start a new life within a few weeks if days like that repeated itself. Remembering how things went I am starting to think that was a part of this game. Making girls think they can do it and keep all the money and then just trap them and make them need you. It's like he tricked me. He made me think I could finally live a clean life. Yeah I was escorting but I treated it like a job. I bought another phone so I had a new number and used the other phone for work and turned it off at like 5 in the evening. I felt rugged. I later that day went back over to the shelter and grabbed the one shirt I had and some personal things and I left with William. That night was cool. He was super chill. We talked in separate beds. We got a two bed and he didn't act like he had interest in me like that which I was happy about because I didn't want to be with anyone. I needed a break from emotional attachment. After Tyler left me I felt like I wouldn't trust anyone like that in a long time so I was happy that I was comfortable in a bed, watching television, freshly showered, with money in my pocket. I had the best night's sleep and woke up to breakfast and time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got us breakfast and cough, he ate with me and then left. He said he will be back in a couple hours, take my time and do what I gotta do. So I did just that. While he was gone, I dyed my hair, did makeup, and the works. Not long after, I was done and waited for him. The door opens and a woman walks in. She's pale and has a beautiful face, long pretty blonde hair that ran down her shoulders. She was carrying a black trash bag that contained all her possessions. William walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna and she needs some help too. He instructed me to get her together, get her pretty and take some pictures and post them. He then told her to go on and take a shower and then asked to talk to me outside. We went outside the door and as I was shutting it his voice got real stern and said I see you have not made any money yet and why is that? I tried to explain that some days were the slowest days and I would be lucky to make any money today. Before I could finish she cut me off and said I don't care you need to make some money. What do you think this hotel pays for itself? I will pay for it tonight but for now only pay half and half of all expenses. Now go make some money. I couldn't even believe he was talking like this I had never seen him so mad and his voice scared me. I looked at him when he cut me off and I could see him get angry. His eyes got wide and the white just to say paired and they became all black. I was scared but I did what he said. He then left me alone with her while he went out and got food and whatever he did. When Anna got out of the shower and her skin was more exposed as she walked out of the bathroom in a small towel, I knew she was addicted to syringe use. I assumed heroin. She confirmed it after I asked her if it was going to be a problem to not do drugs because that was his rule for me. Why wouldn't it be a rule for the other girls? After my kid's father passed away from an overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls I knew I could get close to, try to help and something happened so I cut all that out. And when she told me I was like okay, no girl, I'm sorry you're gonna have to make some calls because you can't stay here at that point. I didn't even care what William has to say. I don't want her here. Period. As soon as he came through the door I stopped him and took him outside. I just told him I didn't think I could work with her. I didn't want to be around a heroin addict or any kind of addict at that matter. He did make her pack her bathroom and close up and took her home. I think he was trying to please me for some reason. Looking back, William and I then took a ride to Main Street where all the girls walk and work. It was so weird. I remember Remember how I said he knew everyone at the church? He knew all those girls, business owners, police officers, and other men who drove drug dealer cars. I don't know why I didn't just run then. I'll never know. About an hour or two of driving around talking to a bunch of different girls, this random girl jumps in the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years I guess and she had been looking for him and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me but still really pretty like beautiful. She had long thick curly jet black hair. I didn't really get a look at her until we got back to the hotel. William told me he wanted to 
get a few girls together and make some big money. I was always going to be number one and I will never post with another girl because I am the number one. He told me I was important and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick but she was gorgeous. Big blue eyes and pretty skin. It wasn't long before I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular and then at night she would be falling out and nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started a fight with William about it once. I didn't think it was fair honestly. Look she can get high but I can't. What William would do was during the day he would leave me at the hotel to make money and he took Amy to the street and worked her. Well it was two days before they came home with another girl. Yogwadden, a tub, her choice, no family. I only know what they tell me. Her name was Amanda. She was sweet and didn't say much. I tried to get to know her a little better but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy and she didn't get much feedback. More people were calling for Amy. Amy. Amanda stayed with us for a few days before she decided she wanted to go home. Will, Amy, and I didn't stay at that hotel for long. We ended up deep into the city, the farthest away from my hometown, in a bigger room and a little nicer hotel with a view of the whole city. It had a little microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room. Will and Amy brought home two girls that night. I don't remember them much because I wasn't involved with them much. I posted them and the next few days we made money. Every time a girl would make money, they would give it to William because he had them believe he was saving it for them and getting them anything they wanted. I continued to make money on my own and I also gave him my money. I got conspicuous and I will never forget the moment I knew I was not safe. I was outside smoking a cigarette. I wasn't out there long but when I came back into the room William had all three girls posing on the bed as he was coaching them on how to pose and taking pictures of them. I didn't say a word and closed the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I did but it just didn't feel right. I don't know if he heard me open and close the door but I heard him yell my name and said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures. When I got on the web website and tried to post the pictures that now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. William unhappily ran to wherever and put money on a card. When I tried to put the card in it wouldn't accept it and said it wanted bitcoins. I informed William and even showed him the page that it wasn't gonna post. He got furious and yelled at me. He turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and to stay calm. It will be okay. He came right back in with a gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said I needed to find somewhere to post the ad do it where I have done and then left. I don't know if he realized he did that in front of three other girls and I didn't know what I've done meant either. I was terrified and that's when I knew I had to find a way to escape. I learned real quick that I wasn't able to just leave anytime I wanted anymore. After Amy got involved, William changed. He started talking about taking us girls to New York and make big money and travel and go here and there and that alone scared me. I wanted to build a life to get my kids back, not leave state to trick and maybe killed or abandoned. No screw that. I got fearful for my life when he hit me with the gun. I have been hit before, punched like a man, but I have never been hit with a gun. That night I had a couple dates set up and William knew he had to take the girls and leave. I decided to try to make a plan to get away. The first date I made 200. I put 50 in my purse and then put 50 in a pocket and a bra headed away and I left the rest on the table. The second date I made 150. I put half and hid away the rest on the table. William came in the door not long after I was finished and grabbed the money off the table. My purse was sitting right there and I didn't see him do it but he took that money out of my purse and said he had to do something and left again. That was when I made my escape. I made a hundred calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me. He had a friend come and pick me up and bring me to his house. I will never forget the feeling I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of stuff I had collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would come pulling up and see me. That feeling didn't leave me until we hit the highway. I wanted to tell this story because I never have been able to get through telling it. That couldn't help to think where I would be if I stayed and if I would even be alive. So William, let's never meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. It has taken me many years to tell this story out of both fear and embarrassment. I share this today as more than simply therapy for myself, but as a warning to all people, be careful who you meet on social media. In 2018, my ex-husband and I were at the end of a very tumultuous marriage. He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jim. I met Jim on a dating app. I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked 
talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well and they seemed to get along so Jim and I started dating. This guy completely swept me off my feet. Jim was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged, and validated me. Over and over again he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers, and random good deeds just to make me feel safe, wanted, and cared for. I had never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we had been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, he had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad but confident that I had done the right thing for the both of us. That next week he sent me flowers and a card to my workplace, begging for another chance and reassuring me that he would rather try than not and end up regretting it. Even though it was scary, he wanted to take this journey with me. We continued dating and it was just as wonderful. Long nights we spent awake talking, sharing, laughing, love making, and planning. We went places and did things that I had always wanted to do. Then in the deepest, most intimate moments where we would just sit in silence, he would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment asking where I've been all this time. Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended by no fault of Jim and by October, my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time and knew I couldn't afford the place on my own, so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on nor did anyone else I know need a place at the time, so Jim offered to move in. Even then I was hesitant. We had only been together about four months and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. Despite my hesitation, I agreed. He was wonderful to me. How bad could it be? I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jim suddenly became a different person. He was extremely controlling, jealous, and lazy, nothing like the person I thought I had met. And the way he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with friends became a burden, if not impossible because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way. Yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and inconvenience as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December of 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I had given him the option whether he wanted to go or not. It was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I had already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. I opened the invitation to him because he had expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month he knew about it, he insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure he felt welcome if he decided to go, but not to feel obligated. I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going. And even more stunned when we went and he actively acted as though he did not want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the whole thing, mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath, as though being there was absolutely awful to have to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispery insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned into Jim and started praising him. She and I were very close, therefore she was intimately familiar with what I had gone through with my ex-husband. I am so happy she has you. She pleaded through wine happy you have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jim grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back you don't know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time stops and you just know you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat brewing on it for a minute before another light-hearted interaction with Jim prompted him to suddenly snap at me through grit teeth. Stop it. This triggered me and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what his problem was. I called out his behavior and told him if he was going to act that way then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he should have stayed home. He ended up giving a sort of half-effort apology and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night, staring out the dark window at nothing in particular in worried silence. I might have missed up was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course, like waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age, that I was just traumatizing my experiences because I was young. The man who, not six months prior, had validated me, my trauma, and experiences to the ends of the earth. Now every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, 
He would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, I would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk shop at Helene. I really don't care about your work. It's work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was as though he was testing me. When Jim and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most all of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of their issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter he would claim, they weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes, talking about them, including my now ex-husband may as well have become off limits. Anytime I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as insecurity and a threat to the life he was trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot button topic had been established, several times, he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion he would have never dated me back in the day, and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket, noted. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I had stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight, so most of my clothes that I had once felt great in, no longer fit. And since Jim had also been dishonest with me about his financial position, he was always needing extra money here and there leaving me broke almost all of the time after the horrible tragedy happened that following summer while Jim and I were together. I received notice that a good friend I went to art school with shot himself in the head while tripping on drugs. Our whole class was devastated. He was, without contest, the best photographer of our class and one of the most kind-hearted individuals I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also, as someone who is very familiar with drugs, I was rocked. Jim, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off. That's life. I guess that's what he gets for screwing around with drugs. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response and even more later when Jim started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy, asking when the last time it was that I had even talked to this friend. You don't even know this guy anymore. Who cares? I broke up with him the first time after he called me at work raging. I was busy so I wasn't able to answer right away, but once I was finally able to answer, I was met with intense anger. It was storming and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. Why aren't you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes, calling me a bad girlfriend and laying it to me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point, I was done and I lost it. I tore to him over everything, especially causing problems for me at work. That being in my life is a privilege and if he's going to wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave. I didn't want him there when I got home and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest. He flat refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to meet your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was concerned for my safety and had offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene I walked into. My boss stood next to me, watching as this 42 year old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around around my legs, crying into them, I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life, you know that. He cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of the heartless person I had been spending my days with. I shook him off and went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables I could think of. It took a few days, but after about a week, Jim started blowing up my phone, apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way he had treated me and sent me walls and walls of well thought out messages, psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from, and the ways he knows it needs to change. I took him back. Like a dumb, desperate girl, I took him back. It wasn't long into the second round that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with the people in my life and he made sure that I knew it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living, so he had a pretty good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time, I had already attempted to contact Jim to let him know what was going on and where I was. It wasn't long until he got off work, so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, this sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jim barreled and about 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with a name and phone number on it, 
reviewing what he thought was going on with my car. Before Jim butted in, cutting him off, I said she's fine. He snapped. I could see the woman out of the corner of my eye, slink away at this comment, and get into the passenger seat of their car. I could feel the sudden tension, like maybe she's been here before. The gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as Jim walked into the store. I could see he was clearly concerned. Are you okay? He asked in a low, almost whisper you don't have to answer that, but if you need anything. He looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of his car and drove away. I've thought about that couple countless times since that night. Everything went right back to the way it was before, as though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling. If anything, it was worse, because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic, if I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night, we got into an argument. I don't even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I wait to lay down, I heard the television turn on. I have a soundbar, so the volume could get pretty loud. Jim proceeded to turn the volume up and up and up, far past any volume I ever pushed those same speakers to even for parties. The very walls were reverberating with the sound of the television at astronomical volumes. Jim then started laughing hysterically. It was a laughter manic with anger as though something might be funny on television, but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed absolutely horrified at what was happening. I knew things had gotten bad, but now I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded, scoffing, I'll watch television if I want to, and turned it up even louder. I started crying at this point, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. He started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Oh, poor baby is crying again. That's your card, isn't it? Cried. This caused the fight to start again and he started screaming at me, followed me to my bedroom, where he suddenly punched a door not two inches from my head. His eyes were black and he looked me in the eye, sending the clear, unsympathetic and hostile message that that was a warning and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point and I sunk to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jim knew that. All our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions. But he never hit me or even came close to it. I crumpled to the ground feeling powerless, trapped, and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panic state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur, but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. At this point, all that was left in me was to fight. I blacked out and went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid and dangerous as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over and I was ended at that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jim would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tale that I was moving out and tried to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again, and took half off my rent for the next month. I am forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything I would ever expect from a landlord. It took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Though I had contacts for protection, I knew I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. So they persisted. Fru well, the same act from before, the love bombing, the promises, grasping at straws trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in. But I ignored it. He continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him on read. The illusion was destroyed. In one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately what happened to the guy I fell in love with. Jim looked me dead in the eye, smirked, and said that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from that bad husband of yours. You're just stupid and fell for it. Jim, let's not meet ever again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I used to participate in a group that did activities intended towards children. We usually went to neighborhoods to make games for the kids and so on. On Halloween, we usually went to give candy to children while on costumes. That night I was dressed up as the Joker, so I went to the rally point and met the other guys and girls with whom we were going to give candies. We were about 30 or 40. The night went as planned, we did some games, then we handed out some candies and then we said goodbye. Three of my best friends were there, and after the activities were over we sat on a bench and talked about random stuff. Eventually we got to the topic of Halloween parties and how we never went to one. We really wanted to go to a Halloween party, dance, drink, do teenager stuff. I'm kind of an introvert, but I've always tried to live my life so when I'm old I don't have to regret not doing stuff. 
and party was one of them, so I, too, wanted to go to a Halloween party. They called our friends, but no one knew of any party. Eventually, we got in touch with our friend Lewis, who was 18 at the time, asking him if he wanted to do something. He told us he was going to round up a few people, and then we could go out in 20 minutes. In those 20 minutes, we went to a friend's house, we cleaned up, changed clothes, and then Lewis called us back. He told us to go to a park nearby to get together. We went, and we reunited with six of his friends. Four we knew, the other two we didn't, but they were nice. Thinking on what to do next because his house was now unavailable. We decided to go to a skateboard park nearby to see one of them do some sick tricks with his kind of eccentric skateboard. We were all in awe, but after a few minutes we got tired down. After that we went to the cemetery to tell horror stories. Disrespectful, I know, but we were teenagers doing stupid teenager stuff. After that, Lewis said dude, wanna go to drink? We all said let's drink, and we went to a convenience store to buy some alcohol. I think I have to say that in Chile people from that are 16 are expected, yet not legally allowed to drink unless they are with an adult. And we were with people from 18 to 21 years old. Legally adult age is 18, which is also the drinking age. So we had the alcohol, but we didn't have a place to go to drink. So we went to a forest that was about 15 minutes outside of town. We couldn't see nothing. So we were with our phones flashlights on. When we got to a nice quiet spot, we lit up a fire. We made sure that there was no flammable material nearby. In front of us was an open field and behind us was a wall of bushes. So as the night went on, we spent hours listening to music and drinking, telling funny stories, laughing, playing tag. It was a really good while until it wasn't. Anyways, it got to be about 3 in the morning after a while of dancing and drinking. We were kind of wasted, except for Lewis his girlfriend and her sister, all which decided to remain sober in case something came up. We played hide and seek and tag. It was really funny and a very good time. Then, while we were dancing, we heard something in the bushes. We thought it was an animal, like a rat or a bird, so we didn't think none of it. Then, we continued dancing around. I remember seeing clear as day a stone going a few centimeters away from my leg. I thought Lewis kicked it, and I told him, dude, stop kicking rocks this way. He laughed at it off and thought I was drunk and joking. While I was kind of wasted, I was still in my senses. Then I saw another rock going in front of my eyes. It was like in slow motion. I looked up, and I saw on Lewis' face a sheer expression of horror. I got scared as well. The only thing he said to me was run. I was like what? And he screamed at me, run dude. Someone is throwing rocks. I ran back to the town, to the houses and the lights. Behind me people were screaming run and hurry. I ran as fast as I could. I was kind of drunk and the terrain was really muddy. It was really dark and I couldn't see where I was going. All I knew was that I was running towards the lights. I ran ran until I reached the same spot where we came from, already in town, then waited. I was alone, and no one came in. I didn't know where my friends were. After a while, a friend of mine showed up. He screamed at me, dude, give me your jacket or something. They hit Fred on the head. When they came closer to the light, I saw him helping the others to walk. Upon seeing his face, blood was running down and dripping. I immediately gave him my jacket and called an ambulance. Then some of my other friends came, one by one. They all went to Lewis' place because it was nearby. Then Lewis came. Where is my girlfriend and my sister-in-law? He said, I told him she didn't come through. We sent everyone to his house and waited for the two missing people. We were ready to go and face the people throwing rocks in case they were doing something to them. But then they appeared. His girlfriend was hysterically screaming. They hit my sister. They hit her. She is bleeding. We went to her and the whole side of her face was covered in blood. We rushed her to Lewis' house and made sure we were all there. We were, so we calmed down. And when the ambulance came, the two who got hit went there. We then called the cops. I remember some of us being in shock. Others were angry and others were kind of in the middle ground. Lewis was raging. These kids, he kept saying, we didn't know who threw the rocks. I thought we got in the terrain to someone without knowing and the owner tried to scare us away but my friends told me they saw a group of people hiding in the bushes. We left everything at the bonfire, the skateboard, the speaker, some wallets. For me, I had everything safe. Lewis then told me and my friends, dude, let's find these guys, let me call some guys and let's go after them. I was mad, but wanted to retrieve some of the stuff, so I told him that we would go, but if there were too many of them, then we would turn back. He called two of his friends and in five minutes they were with us. I knew them because of some school stuff, but they were very loyal and they both went to the gym. They were some big guys, so I felt safe when they came. Eventually, we went out to look for the people who threw rocks. When we were about a block away from the forest, we saw them walking with our speaker, the skateboard, and other stuff we left there. We were a block away from them and we just stared at each other. There was like 15 of them and only 6 of us, so we didn't do anything and just turned back. As we got a good look at them, they were clearly gang members, so they probably had guns and knives. When we came back home, we ran into the police car. There were two of them. One got out of the car. We told them we called and explained the situation very fast. 
because we didn't want the guys to run away. However, the officer told us you were telling me you were drinking, B minors, and then got attacked. We told him yes, and then he responded with the most upsetting stuff ever. So you minors were drinking, doing a bonfire at the forest in the middle of the night, and are now asking me to give you justice. Don't you kids realize how hypocritical you are? I responded with we were in supervision of three adults, and not because we were drinking we deserve rocks being thrown at our heads dude. He looked at me with an expression of pure hatred. I was really scared but angry as well. He then repeated himself. We told him the guys were running away as we spoke, but he kept saying it was our fault we were in that situation. After a few minutes, the one inside the car told the other hey, let's find the other people and then we could question these kids, and the other got inside. We waited at the house, but they never came back. Eventually, we all went to our respective homes. Lewis told us the next day that the policemen never returned. Before I had even graduated from high school, I knew I wanted to live in an apartment. I was a bit naive at the time, drawn in by the many amenities I would never use, but I primarily wanted to live there because the complex was pet friendly and within my small budget. When the time eventually came for me to get my own place, I sublet the only apartment that was available and moved in. Unfortunately, I came to realize the apartment wasn't as nice as I'd originally thought. The building was old but remodeled, so it had all the typical plumbing issues and thin walls. I also learned it was not the safest part of town. I was primarily an online student, but I had one class that met in person twice a week around 8 in the morning. I'm a bit of a homebody, so I rarely left during the day except for that class, the occasional shopping excursion, or to spend time with my boyfriend in the evening after he got off work. My apartment was a bit of a Bermuda Triangle, even though it was only 600 square feet, and I lived alone. Things had a way of growing legs and walking away. I had two kittens at the time and blamed them regularly for things disappearing. Something odd that kept reoccurring, however, was that I'd find my my underwear box out and sitting in the center of my bedroom floor on days when I had class. I didn't have a proper dresser, instead using a shelf with some boxes for designated clothes, socks, underwear, pants, pajamas. I always could have sworn I put the underwear box away after getting ready for class, but I chalked it up to me forgetting as a result of having to get up early and being focused on getting to class on time. Arguably paranoid, I started to think that some of my laundry was disappearing as well, as favorite articles of clothing would go into the laundry hamper and seemingly never come back with the clean clothes. Towards the end of that semester, I was working one evening on a homework assignment when my boyfriend called to let me know his roommate had accidentally locked him out of their apartment. I had a key to their place, so he asked if I could run over real quick to let him in. Before I left, I made a mental note that I had left literally every light in my apartment on. Because I was living on a pretty tight budget, I normally made a point of turning off all the lights when I left, but my boyfriend only lived about 5 minutes away, so I knew I'd be there and back very quickly. Sure enough, I got back less than 15 minutes later. I immediately sensed something was off, as I could see the lights were off through the blinds. I called my boyfriend and he drove over to meet me. We unlocked the door and went in. All the lights were off in my apartment. Thinking maybe I'd had a power outage, I flipped on the main light and it came on. My boyfriend checked the entire apartment. No one was inside, but someone had gone through and systematically turned off every light at their switch, including my lizard's basking light, the only light I always left on, because it was on a timer and my laptop, which I left open on my assignment, but now the computer had been powered down and closed. We called the emergency maintenance number and I explained that someone had been inside my apartment and that they had to have used a key because there was no sign of forced entry. The manager called me back and told me I had to be imagining things. Maybe I had forgotten that I had turned off the lights before I left. I assured him that I wouldn't have turned off the computer or the lizard light. Someone had been in my apartment. I told him I was extremely worried because obviously this person had a key to get in. Either they worked for the complex or maybe it was a previous tenant slash guest. I asked if they had changed the locks after the previous tenant moved out and they assured me they changed the locks after every move out. The manager suggested maybe it was a friend pranking me, someone else I had given a key. The only other people I had given keys were my boyfriend. His key to my apartment had been locked inside his apartment on the same keyring as his own apartment key. And my mom, she lived three hours away. In any case, neither of them would have pranked me in this way. The manager finally agreed to send someone out immediately to change the lock for my peace of mind. I brought up my concern that it was someone on the staff since they would be the only other people with keys. The manager claimed the keys were locked in a special safe that required a personalized code to track who took what keys and when in an office with a security camera. They changed my locks, but I had my doubts that it would do much good. As far as I was aware, there were only two maintenance men that worked at the complex, one nice, older man that didn't seem all that skilled, and a younger guy with a scruffy beard that gave me a bad feeling. I suspected he had to be the one that had come in. When I had first moved in, the manager had told me I would be getting a new kid 
kitchen counter within the first three days. I waited to move in my kitchen stuff, but after a week they had it come, and then after a few months I had completely forgotten about it. One day I was sitting in my living room and this scruffy maintenance guy walked in without knocking or announcing himself and I hadn't received a notice to expect him. He said he was there to replace my countertop. It took him two days to install one small piece of counter. A few weeks later, I was getting out of the shower and heard a single knock at the door. I called out, just one minute, and hurried to get some clothes. Not two seconds later, the door started to open and I had to slam it shut, still wrapped in a towel, to stop him from coming in. He claimed he hadn't heard me call out, but I had my doubts. I don't remember what made up excuse he had for coming in. Another time, I found a note from him that he had come in. Again, he didn't give it a reason as to why, but that he made sure not to let my cats out. He also made a note about my third cat being cute, except I didn't have a third cat. I did, however, have a picture of my childhood cat in my bedroom on the shelf where I kept my clothes. At that point, I went to the office to ask them to make a note in my file that I wanted at least 24 hours notice before entry going forward and I wanted to always be present for future entry. Now that I knew without a shadow of a doubt that someone was coming in secretly, it all made sense. It hadn't been long after the surprise maintenance visit stopped that things had started moving around in my apartment. He was also on site all the time. Everyone on staff also lived at the apartment complex, so he would know when I came and went. After the night with the lights, I put my own lock on the door, but still didn't totally trust the apartment. I ended up buying a condo shortly after with help from my parents, subleased the apartment, and moved. Right around that time, I also got my first job working in a different apartment complex. In the final days before I left, my mom came into town to help me move my stuff. While she was home alone, I was at a class, she caught the scruffy maintenance man trying to get his key to work in my lock. She demanded to know what he was doing and he said he was there to paint the front door. I hadn't received a notice and he didn't have any paint or supplies. She told him he could wait until after I had moved out. A few years later, I was stopped by the owner of the apartment complex while working at another complex in town. Shopping is when an employee from one apartment complex takes a tour at another apartment complex under the guise of wanting an apartment for the purpose of gaining information they might not otherwise easily give up. It can also be performed by your own management company to make sure you're doing a good job. There were certain tells a shopper always gave, like asking specifically worded questions, is it safe here? I'm a felon, can I live here? That required specifically worded answers and were easy to trip up on, being too wealthy for the complex, Rolex watch, sports car, nice suit, and being too flexible on what they were interested in. They were interested in all the layouts and were open to move in whenever. This guy seemed too old and too well off to be randomly considering an apartment here. We were geared towards lower income people. While I was giving the tour, he asked if I had any opinions on other apartment complexes in town and mentioned the old one I worked at specifically. Normally, I wouldn't badmouth any other complexes. I preferred to win them over by showing them the positives of our community, but I told him that I probably wasn't the best person to answer that question because I was probably the only person to give the old apartment complex I worked in a bad review in the last five years. He asked me to elaborate, and I told him my apartment had been broken into and I suspected it was someone on their maintenance staff. At that point, he revealed that he was the owner of the old complex and that he was very disturbed to hear I had this experience. He asked me to describe the maintenance man in detail. I assured him it was in the past and I was over it, but he insisted on calling the manager over at the complex, still the same guy, to ask him over speakerphone if they had had any issues with the maintenance staff back in the year I had lived there. He answered yes, there had been a scruffy young maintenance man he'd had to fire because he'd been caught multiple times breaking into the apartments of single women. Satisfied, the owner proudly told me the issue had been resolved and asked if I would be willing to change my review. I told him no, none of this had changed the fact I'd experienced this and actually validated what I had suspected. In the years I worked as a leasing agent, I learned a lot about where complexes will cut corners to save time and money. From my experience, a lot of complexes did not switch out the locks if the tenant was good and a lot did not require bad backgrounds checks for employees even though they did require them for tenants. He's also got passed out willy-nilly to vendors and maintenance during turns, and employees frequently got master keys that would open all doors. I won't go so far as to say every complex operates this way, but every complex I worked at was doing this when I started there. Because of my own experiences, once I began managing a complex, I enforced strict rules about changing locks, tracking keys, posting proper notices, and requiring background checks for all employees and tenants. If you're renting an apartment, stay diligent. If you have reason to believe someone is coming into your home, document it and let the staff slash police slash family slash friends know. You never know who might have a key to your apartment. 
several years ago, I was in the midst of an acrimonious divorce from my then husband, full of crazy allegations and typical angry filings centered around custody of our child. As with many divorces, friends and professional colleagues seemed to pick one side or the other. In my case, there was one sort of professional contact who reached out to me after hearing about the divorce who offered to be a witness for my case because of some experiences he related that I had been previously unaware of regarding my ex's behavior out at networking events. After this initial call, he started calling on a semi-regular basis to make sure I was okay. This wasn't someone I knew well prior to the separation, and he was much older than I was, but claimed to have experience with divorce and custody, and I figured it was a good idea to be polite and not alienate him, since his testimony was important. Per my lawyer, I kept things friendly, but I always had a weird feeling about him. After a few months, he called one day that my son was very sick, and when I told him I couldn't talk and explained why, he offered to run to the store for me, which I honestly appreciated. But after that, he was dropping by the house uninvited, or he would stop by with cookies for my son. Again, I kept telling myself to keep things polite, the divorce is coming soon, don't make this guy mad. He had called me out of the blue, and I was worried at this point that I was walking a very fine line be polite but clearly not interested, and that if he got mad, he might decide to go testify for my ex and say who knows what. During this time, he had also helped me set up a security cam system my dad had mailed me, and at one point, I needed someone to walk my dog and he had offered to do it. He used a return of spare key the same day. One evening he showed up while I was painting and insisted on sticking around to help, even though I was having my starting over catharsis and wanted to do it alone. Just after the painting day, he came around, uninvited and unannounced, with magazine photos of decor, and started carrying on in this manic way about how we could finish decorating the house. I was so weirded out that I made an excuse to leave, started ignoring his calls, and took my son and dog to stay with my parents for several weeks to avoid a drop-in. I came home just for custody exchanges. I came home home a few weeks later, thinking he would have gotten the hint, and it was a quiet day. The following morning, I took my son on an outing, something like the zoo, and we both came back hot and tired. I put my kid down for a nap in my bed, and decided to close my eyes with him. I woke up maybe an hour or so later, and it took me a moment to realize something was way off. As I'm blinking off the sleep, I realized there was a rose bush sitting on my bedside table that I most definitely had not put there. There was a post-it note on it, something about planting it in the yard. I started shaking immediately because I recognized the handwriting and stood up to go splash some water in my face and decide whether to call my parents or the police. I didn't want any trouble because of the divorce. As I stepped into my bathroom, I realized that the mirror was covered in post-it notes, all with super creepy messages that were intended as like love notes or with affection but which all scared me. I was still waking up and trying to figure out how these notes could possibly have gotten into my house. My front door was definitely locked, but as I went from room to room, there were notes everywhere. I made hundreds of post-it notes covering the walls and my cabinets. There was even one inside my coffee maker. I started grabbing all of them and putting them into a pile when I got to one in the kitchen that made my blood run cold. It said, you're cute when you think no one is watching you. And I realized that there was a security camera pointed right where that note was left. The one he had helped me set up months earlier when I didn't think he was a psychopath. I called my parents in hysterics, sent them a bunch of photos, and my dad insisted I should not call police, remember custody battle, but that he would drive over and change the locks and put a chain on the door. We also immediately changed the passwords on the security cameras, which had been installed to document if my ex tried to break into the house. So there was one on the front porch, but three inside the house, including one in my bedroom. This man could apparently see and hear everything going on inside my house for months. The security cameras, I realized he had just paid attention to my passwords when I was setting up the system, but the only way I could figure out that he got into my house is that he must have made a copy of my house key the day he had it. And because my dog had gotten to know him, he wouldn't have barked to warn me, which also scared me. I was absolutely horrified. This man had been in my house for a long time. There's no way he could have put that many notes up quickly, and he was right next to my face at feed from my son while we were sleeping and somehow thought that was okay. I left and stayed with my parents again for a few days, afraid of what he was going to do when he realized that he was now both physically and digitally locked out of my house. When I came home, my son had gone to his dad's for the night, and I was home alone on the phone with another friend from out of town. At about 10 at night, this man showed up at the door, pounding on it, trying the locks, screaming obscenities, and demanding to be let into his house. Gone were all the niceties. This was somewhat completely furious and derailed. All I could do was hide in my bedroom until he left, what 
felt like an hour later. This was St. Patrick's Day, so I am sure he had been drinking. After that, there were several other times someone would start knocking on the door in the middle of the night, always when my son wasn't home. I think he was crazy, but not that crazy and figured if I called police he would get in more trouble if my son was there, but he knew the schedule, so I know it was him. He tried reaching out using fake social media accounts several times, always getting blocked. Years later, I discovered that he had friended my mom on Facebook and was therefore still able to see all the photos of us that she posted or shared, and there was a huge argument when I saw she had left her computer logged in, a conversation they were having about me and how he could get back into my life. I sold that house two years later, still finding new notes even as I was packing, and I am more than relieved that he no longer knows where I live. I don't post photos of my new house online, not the front, anyway, and I have changed the privacy settings on my social media accounts. I avoid all the places he used to go, the networking events he attends, and I stay as under the radar as possible. I could never bring myself to play back the security camera videos because I was traumatized enough and didn't want to see just how much danger we could have been in. This roller coaster of a story is still ongoing two years later with no end in sight. It all started when I wanted to further my education and get a bachelor's in information systems. To give a little about myself to help paint the picture, I'm a 26, 4 foot 8 woman. I get called jailbait often because I look way younger. During the beginning of my studies, my current boyfriend and I had broken up, so I told myself it would be best to stay single until I finished school. I took to the internet after my breakup, as most do, just looking for company. I had found this one group on Facebook where I felt like I belonged. I got along well with everyone, and I loved to flirt in this group. That's where I met him. Let's call him Kemper. Like many others before him, I had latched my claws into him and began flirting. I even had a little crush on him. Things began innocently. I flirted, and he flirted back in the group. He seemed very mysterious though. I guess that's what drew me to him. He didn't have a profile picture, not of him at least. He never told me his age or what he looked like. After a few weeks of flirting, a woman in the group we were both in had mentioned that it was his birthday. I knew I wanted to do something for him, but I was pretty limited on what I could do. Now, before I get flagged for this, just know, I have never sent an unsolicited topless picture to another man, not until that day at least. On the picture, I wrote happy birthday, insert his name here, and press the send button on messenger. Just that split second and decision had changed my life the past two years. It's so easy looking back and thinking what you could have done differently, but there is no going back now. Within a week of talking non-stop to Kemper, he was already telling me he loved me. He was working as a truck driver, but at the time he had broken his knee at work. So, he was at a commission for a few months, which allowed him to talk to me as much as possible. During this time, I was working as a delivery driver with DoorDash. It was easier for me to make my own schedule since I wasn't done with school just yet. The first few months were great. We would talk constantly over the phone and through messenger. Also, let me point out quickly that this was a long distance relationship between Kemper and myself. So, I remember the first fight we ever had. Heck, even before then I could see the red flag slapping me in the face at every turn. However, our first fight was because I was texting him while driving. He flipped his lid and totally went crazy on me. It was very unexpected and it made me cry. I can't tell you how many times I tried to apologize and tell him it wouldn't happen again. After the incident, I was blown away how easily something so little, or at least I I thought it was little, would make him do a complete 180. Months go by and the fights continue more frequently. One point, he had mentioned how cool it would be to have an app where we could see each other's location. In my naive and in love state, I did some quick search and found an app called Life360. We both downloaded the app and now, he could see everywhere I go. At first, it was a neat idea to say the least, to follow him around everywhere he went to feel closer and more connected to him. That's what I used it for, he however, wanted to use it for different reasons. I learned over time how controlling, manipulative, and how psychotic he was. We would argue about things and even when I get mad, he would somehow turn things around on me and make me feel like I'm the bad guy. The first time we broke up, it was a bad show. He had broken up with me on the group we were both in just because I had flirted with another guy and he didn't like it. He was telling the other guys in the group how much of a bad person I was and how they could have mean. He even threatened to give out my address to the guys in the group so they can come to my house and, well, I'm sure you get the idea. My friend, let's call him Adam for the sake of the story, he was a member of the group and he he could tell how upset I was in the group comments and he messaged me personally for the first time. Kemper and Adam are both well-off men with the world at their fingertips. I guess that's part of the controlling bits or showing aggression when they don't get their way about things. Before I go into more detail about Adam, I just want to recount a few incidents with Kemper to give the readers a better understanding of what kind of man he is, and how dumb I am letting things to continue the way they have. One incident happened months ago. He and I were fighting seemingly over nothing, and I was driving home from a long day of work and school, and Kemper just blurts out I wish he would just run off the road and 
handed to a ditch and died. I was speechless. The tears welled up in my eyes and the driving became harder because I couldn't see, so he almost got his wish. I had to stop at the Dollar General in my town to compose myself. I couldn't breathe. I was wheezing. The man I had thought I loved was wishing I would die. If he hated me that much, why is keeping me around? I just wanted to curl into a ball at that moment and just disappear for a while. I didn't want to go home, but I couldn't just stay parked at Dollar General. I was really at a loss for what to do. It wasn't until a while later where I told my mom and dad what he said. They were already getting their pitchforks ready, and ever since then, they haven't liked him. Kemper has anger issues along with so many other issues as well. I know I'm not perfect, but at least I don't act like he does. I'm very friendly, and I get along with almost everyone. I guess that's part of his problem with me. We are complete opposites when it comes to that. During our time together, I had gotten two other jobs at different times besides the DoorDash gig. Just part-time though. Notice I said I'd gotten two jobs. Well, the first one was at Walgreens. The very first day on the job, I was doing certifications for the job and during the whole time. He was blowing up my phone, telling me I don't need another job, or telling me that I won't have time for him, or that he would need to find someone else to replace the time I had spent with him while also keeping me around. I just couldn't take it, so I quit. Fast forward a few months later, I get another job. This one was at Dollar General just at the town over. I did work there more than a day, but his nagging ultimately made me quit that job as well. I just recently had a talk with him about graduating soon and how I will find a job at a hospital working normal hours with better pay. Well, he didn't like that too much. He found some reason to be mad at me and start a fight, and he has gotten in the habit of ignoring me for a day or two. He's even ignored me for a whole week, and honestly, that was the most peace I had gotten in a long time. As of right now, Kemper and I will have the chance to meet this coming January 2023, although I'm really not sure about it. Two years of ups and downs, and I'm happy in my heart and ripping out when it's convenient for him has me thinking it may not be the best idea. Also, it may be the fact that he has told me of his violent past with an ex-girlfriend of his. This happened many years ago, but it's scary me knowing he could be this violent. What had happened was, his girlfriend at the time was putting on makeup, he hates makeup, and they got into an altercation with him blacking out, and him pinning her down to the bed and choking her. He didn't even realize what he was doing until he came to his senses. He's told me lately that if he ever caught me in his bed with another man, he would punch me in the face, not the guy simply because the man didn't know better, and I did. I've spent a lot of time and effort into this relationship and wanting it to work out in the end but honestly, not sure if meeting would be the best thing to do, now or ever. So, let's talk about Adam. He's a tad bit older than me. He's 49 years old while Kemper is 48 years old. You would think they would be mature for their age. Well, Adam is very mature, Kemper not so much. Adam and I began talking the first time Kemper and I had broken up. He was being a concerned friend and messaged me asking me what was going on. I spilled everything to him. He was like a best friend I didn't know I had. He was so easy to talk to and he even began opening up to me about his troubled upbringing. We would talk about everything and the topics would become more intimate. After a month or so of talking, he too would begin to tell me he loved me, but only as a friend. I knew better than that and it made me uncomfortable knowing that someone I've only had a hand full of conversations with would tell me he loved me. Over time, I felt bad for talking to this man, but he was a comfort when Kemper and I had broken up. But our conversations went from semi-normal just to weird. Let me mention real quick, just like Kemper, he too didn't have a profile picture, but he would post pictures of himself on the group. So I knew what he looked like, and he was a very handsome man. After a while of talking to him, he would send me some other pictures which seemed to be newer pictures which looked nothing like the pictures he had posted in the group. I didn't make a fuss out of it, just assumed the pictures in the group were older pictures. One day he had told me he was getting a haircut. I was trying to be polite and asked for a picture to see the new haircut. Days later, he finally sent me that picture. I wasn't sure who this person in the picture was. It looked absolutely nothing like the previous pictures he had sent. At the moment, I assumed I was being catfished, but it didn't matter to me because looks really don't matter. So, this is my story so far. Not sure how things will turn out, but as of right now, let's not meet. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Living in a big city has its ups and downs, and as someone who grew up in a small town, adjusting to the chaotic pace was challenging. My name's Jane, and a few years ago, I started working in the city, making the hour-long subway commute a daily ritual. The office crowd in the mornings was a bustling hive of activity, but returning home was a different story. My shifts often had me leaving work past midnight, boarding the last subway, which was usually vacant except for a handful of passengers. One Thursday night, as I nestled into my regular corner seat, pulling out a book to read, I noticed a man 
few compartments away. He was tall, with long unkempt hair, and wore a tattered coat that had seen better days. His face was hidden in the shadows, but I could feel his eyes on me. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling, telling myself I was just being paranoid. However, as the stations went by and passengers dwindled, my discomfort grew. He began to shift seats, always moving closer to me but never overtly so. It was subtle, an aisle crossed, a seat moved forward, always maintaining the indirect line of sight. By the time we reached the second last stop, it was just the two of us in the carriage. The fluorescent lights flickered intermittently, casting the car in alternating moments of illumination and darkness. My stop was next, and my heart raced as the train slowed. As soon as the doors opened, I bolted out, not even looking back. The station was deserted, echoing with the soft hum of vending machines and distant city noises. I made my way to the stairs, trying to shake off my paranoia. Just as I began to ascend, a chilly voice echoed from behind, where are you rushing off to? It was him. Panic flooded me. Instead of going up to the main exit, I turned and ran towards the other end of the platform, leading to a lesser used exit. My heels clicked loudly on the tile floor, each echo magnifying my fear. As I risked a glance back, I saw his silhouette approaching, his pace unnaturally calm. Reaching the exit, I pushed through the turnstile, only to find the exit door locked. Despair washed over me, but then, in the dim light, I spotted a maintenance door ajar. Without a second thought, I slipped through. The room was dark and filled with the rhythmic hum of machinery. I could hear the distant sound of his footsteps echoing in the corridor outside. I found a quarter behind some equipment and crouched down, trying to quiet my breathing. Minutes felt like hours as I strained my ears for any sign of him. Suddenly, the door creaked open and the faint light from the corridor spilled into the room. I could hear him, softly humming a tune as he searched. Tears welled up in my eyes as I thought of all the worst case scenarios. But then, a distant sound broke through my despair, the familiar chug of an approaching subway train. Seizing the distraction, I made a break for the door. As I ran back onto the platform, a subway train was pulling in, not the last one as I thought. Without looking at its destination, I jumped aboard just as the doors were closing. As the train pulled away, I finally looked back. He stood there, on the platform, staring at the departing train, his face finally illuminated. There was no anger or frustration, just a cold, unnerving smile. Once I was sure I was safe, I reported the incident to the authorities. They examined the CCTV footage and found him lurking in the subway station's shadows for hours, seemingly waiting for someone. Someone like me. The next day, an officer informed me that they had identified the man. He had a history of stalking and had served time for aggravated assault. They promptly arrested him. I later found out from a colleague that the train I'd boarded was a special service, not on the regular timetable, deployed due to an earlier disruption. It was sheer luck that it had been there. The experience left me shaken. I moved closer to my workplace, cutting out the long subway commutes from my routine. But more than the move, it changed my perspective on personal safety. Despite the harrowing encounter, life had to go on. But every time I approached a subway or heard the distant sound of a train, a pang of anxiety would seize me, pulling me back to that dreadful night. The bustling streets, the throngs of commuters, the distant hum of city life, everything seemed to remind me of the lurking dangers in the shadows. As days turned to weeks, my friends noticed the change in me. Where I once loved exploring new places, I now opted for familiar spots, preferably within walking distance. Night outs became less frequent, and when I did go out, it was always with a group, never alone. Lily, a close friend and colleague, was the most concerned. You can't let them steal your joy, Jane. She told me one evening as we shared a quiet dinner at her place. I know, but it's not that easy, I replied, my voice quivering. Every shadow, every stranger. It's like I'm constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop. She paused, thinking for a moment, then said, you know, my grandma used to say that the best way to overcome fear is to face it head on. Maybe you need to confront this trauma directly. The thought of facing my fear sounded like a cliche self-help mantra, but there was some truth in Lily's words. I remembered my self-defense classes. The empowerment I felt wasn't just from the physical techniques, but from facing my vulnerabilities and building strength. Determined to reclaim my life, I began taking therapy sessions with Dr. Rosalind, a renowned psychologist specializing in trauma. Our sessions delved deep into my fears, analyzing and dissecting them. Dr. Rosalind introduced me to exposure therapy where in controlled environments, I confronted the triggers of my trauma. She accompanied me to subway stations during off-peak hours, standing by my side as I faced the rush of trains and the echoes of underground tunnels. Over time, and with repeated exposure, my anxiety began to wane. One Saturday, four months after starting therapy, I took a major step. I boarded the subway alone and traveled the same route I took that fateful night. I could feel my heart 
heart racing as the stops went by, but when I finally reached that dreaded platform, a newfound sense of peace washed over me. The haunting memories were still there, but they no longer held power over me. News of my assailant's capture and subsequent trial filled the local papers. The evidence against him was overwhelming. The testimonies of his past victims, coupled with the security footage from that night, ensured a long prison sentence. As the trial came to an end, I felt a chapter of my life closing. The city, once a menacing maze of threats, transformed back into a vibrant hub of opportunities. One evening, as I was returning from work, a young woman approached me near the subway station. Excuse me, she said, I've seen you before in my self-defense class. I wanted to thank you. Your story inspired me to join, and it's made a world of difference. Touched, I realized that my ordeal, while deeply personal, resonated with many. My journey of recovery had inadvertently become a beacon of hope for others facing their own demons. With renewed purpose, I collaborated with my self-defense instructor to start a support group for survivors of stalking and assault. The group provided a safe space for sharing stories, coping techniques, and resources for healing. As the months rolled on, our group grew, and our stories of resilience began to weave a tapestry of empowerment. We organized workshops, partnered with local law enforcement, and raised awareness on personal safety. Life has a way of coming full circle. While I would never wish my experience on anyone, it shaped me in profound ways. From the depths of vulnerability, I found strength. From the shadows of fear, I discovered a voice. And in the echoey chambers of a subway station, I found a purpose that resonated far beyond its walls. After graduating, my best friend Mark and I embarked on a cross-country road trip. We planned to drive from the East Coast all the way to California, making stops at national parks, quirky motels, and roadside attractions. The trip was both a celebration of our new independence and an attempt to create lasting memories before our lives became ensnared by 9-5 to five jobs. Our third week on the road found us in the heartland of America, cruising along endless stretches of asphalt that dissected vast farmlands. Mark and I often took turns driving, ensuring the other could rest. But today, with the summer sun casting long shadows on the road, he seemed lost in thought, his gaze Distant. You good, Mark? I asked. Yeah, just thinking about the detour I found on the map last night. There's this town, Bristlewood, not too far from here. The reviews mentioned a family diner there that serves the best apple pie in the Midwest. Given our shared love for pie, it didn't take much convincing. We veered off the main highway, following a series of smaller roads that seemed less traveled. Fields of golden corn stretched out on both sides, their tassels dancing in the breeze. We reached Bristlewood by evening, and true to the reviews, found the charming family diner. The scent of freshly baked pies wafted out, welcoming us in. Inside, the ambience was nostalgic, with checkered tiles and vinyl seats. An older lady, probably in her 60s, greeted us with a warm smile, introducing herself as Clara, the owner. The apple pie was indeed delightful. As we relished it, Clara regaled us with tales of Bristlewood, how it used to be a thriving town in the 70s seconds, with its annual pie festival attracting tourists. But as the younger generation moved to bigger cities, it had become more of a quiet, forgotten place. After bidding Clara goodbye, we decided to spend the night in Bristlewood. Mark had found a listing for a bed and breakfast run by a local family. The B&B, an old Victorian house, was beautifully preserved. Mr. and Mrs. Higgins, the proprietors, were friendly, treating us more like long-lost relatives than paying guests. Over dinner, they spoke about their children who had moved away and how they turned their home into a B&B for the company and a little extra income. Late that night, while Mark was showering, I decided to take a walk. The air was cool, and the town was bathed in the soft glow of streetlights. But as I strolled, I noticed something odd. A black SUV with tinted windows was parked a short distance away. I could have sworn I'd seen the same vehicle earlier that day, tailing us a few times. Brushing off the thought, I headed back to the B&B, but the seat of unease had been planted. The next morning, as we packed and loaded our car, I noticed the black SUV again. This time it was parked a couple of houses down. I pointed it out to Mark, who also found it strange. Maybe someone's just visiting. He suggested twice in two different places, in both times near us. He he thought for a moment, let's just get on the road and if we notice it following us again, we'll call the police. Agreeing, we set off. For the next few hours, everything seemed normal. We laughed, sang along to our favorite songs, and shared road trip snacks. But as we approached a particularly desolate stretch, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The black SUV was there, maintaining a consistent distance. Our playful mood faded. Mark tried to reassure me, suggesting it might just be a coincidence. But 
but when we took a sudden exit and the SUV followed, it was clear we were being tailed. Panicking, I called the local sheriff's office, describing our situation. The operator advised us to drive to the nearest police station while they dispatched a patrol car to intercept the SUV. The following minutes were tense. The SUV seemed to realize we were onto them and began to speed up, drawing dangerously close. At one point, they tried to force us off the road. Suddenly, blue flashing lights appeared on the horizon. A police car sped towards us, sirens wailing. Seeing this, the SUV made a hasty U-turn and sped off. The police took our statements and said they'd be on the lookout for the vehicle. We never did find out who was in the SUV or their intentions, but we didn't stick around to find out. Opting for main highways and well-traveled routes, we continued our journey, always vigilant. Mark and I often reflected on that eerie encounter as the years passed. Our road trip, which spanned a couple of months, was mostly filled with breathtaking views, hilarious misadventures, and the shared joy of exploring unfamiliar terrains. But that episode with the mysterious SUV was a reminder of how unpredictable life could be and how danger could lurk even in the most unexpected places. A few years later, while attending Mark's wedding, I met his cousin, Lisa, who had recently joined the police force in a neighboring state. As we chatted, I brought up our Bristlewood experience, curious to see if she'd heard of similar cases in her line of work. Lisa's face turned serious. Actually, I did come across something similar. About a year ago, we arrested a group involved in a series of robberies. They tailed tourists or outsiders, studied their routines, and robbed them. A few incidents got violent. The most sounds eerily similar. The thought said chills down my spine. While our encounter had been unsettling, hearing that such incidents weren't isolated was deeply disturbing. Did they use a black SUV? Mark asked, joining the conversation. Lisa nodded. Yes, among other vehicles. They had a whole operation going on. We busted them after they targeted an undercover cop. Grateful as we were to escape unharmed, it was comforting to know that those responsible had been apprehended. Mark and I exchanged glances, silently acknowledging our bond, one that had only strengthened after facing danger together. Years turned into decades, and while the pace of life accelerated, our friendship remained unwavering. We both settled in different states, started families, and pursued our respective careers. But every year, on the anniversary of our road trip, we'd meet up for a short vacation, often with our families in tow. As our children grew, they'd listen, wide-eyed, to our many adventures, the stunning vistas, the hilarious mishaps, the eccentric people we'd met and, of course, the mysterious black SUV. The story became a cautionary tale, a reminder for them to always be vigilant and trust their instincts, especially when traveling. As much as we loved exploring, Mark and I wanted to ensure our children understood the importance of safety. One summer, nearly 30 years after our road trip, Mark and I, along with our families, decided to revisit some of the places we'd been to. While Bristlewood wasn't on the itinerary, Clara's diner was. To our surprise, it was still standing, a little more worn but exuding the same charm. Walking in felt like stepping back in time. We half expected Clara to greet us, but instead, a young woman, probably in her 30s, approached with a smile. Welcome to Clara's diner. How can I help you? Mark, with a twinkle in his eye, replied, we've heard you have the best apple pie in the Midwest. The woman laughed, that we do. You've been here before. Yes, I replied, many years ago. Clara was the one who served us. The woman's face lit up. Clara was my grandmother. She passed away a few years back, but I've taken over the diner. I'm Emily. The rest of the evening was spent reminiscing with Emily sharing stories of Clara and how the diner had become a legacy she intended to preserve. As we left, she handed each of us a box with a slice of apple pie, her grandmother's recipe. Driving away from Bristlewood that night, the memories of our past trip came flooding back, the good, the bad, the inexplicable, but the enduring lesson remained. Life was unpredictable, filled with moments of joy and peril. The key was to cherish the former and learn from the latter. Mark glanced over, echoing my sentiments. Two adventures, old and new, he toasted, raising his slice of apple pie. Two adventures, I echoed back, grateful for the journey and the company I'd shared it with. Growing up in a small town has its advantages. Everyone knows everyone, kids roam free without fear, and life generally moves at a more leisurely pace. But it was these same idyllic qualities that made what happened one fateful summer night even more unsettling. After graduating from college, I found myself back in my hometown for a short period. To save money, I'd taken a late night job at a gas station at the edge of town, a stone's throw from the old, disused railway station. Once a bustling hub, the train station had become obsolete with the advent of highways and more modern transport systems. 
systems. While some locals still remembered catching trains there, to my generation, it was just a relic, an abandoned structure fading into obscurity. On this particular night, it was exceptionally quiet. The gas station's fluorescent lights were the only source of illumination for miles, creating a small island of light in the enveloping darkness. The occasional vehicle would pull in, breaking the monotony, but hours often passed with no sign of human activity. Around 2 a.m., as I was contemplating closing early, I heard the faint but distinct sound of a train whistle. This took me by surprise. The rails hadn't seen a train in years, and they were covered with rust and overgrowth. I stepped outside, curious, and looked in the direction of the old station. Through the darkness, I saw the silhouette of a train pulling into the station. Its lights were dim, and there was an eerie stillness around it, as if time itself had paused. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was imagining things, but the sea remained unchanged. Then, I noticed something even more unsettling, figures disembarking from the train. They looked like people, but there was a certain opacity to them, making them appear like faded photographs. They moved with a slow, deliberate pace towards the town. I felt a knot of dread tighten in my stomach. These apparitions didn't seem hostile, but the sheer unnaturalness of the scene froze me in place. As the last figure moved away, the train let out another long, mournful whistle before it too seemed to dissolve into the night. Unsure of what to do, I locked the gas station and decided to follow them from a distance. My heart raced as I trailed these spectral beings. They moved in a single file, not interacting with each other, seemingly drawn by an unknown force. They wound their way through the town, passing familiar landmarks, the town library, the old bakery, the church. It was bizarre to see these places, which were such a normal part of my everyday life, juxtaposed against this otherworldly procession. Finally, the group stopped at the entrance to the town cemetery. One by one, they drifted towards the older gravestones, stopping in front of specific ones. I watched, headed behind a large oak tree, as the figures seemed to merge or sink into the gravestones, disappearing from view. Once the last figure had vanished, an overwhelming silence engulfed the cemetery. The only sound was the beating of my own heart, which seemed definitely loud in the stillness. I mustered the courage to inspect the gravestones the figures had approached. They were all old, weathered by time, some barely legible. But a pattern began to emerge, the dates. Every stone belonged to people who had died exactly a hundred years ago, in 1920. A chill ran down my spine as I recalled my grandmother's tales of a train accident that had occurred a century ago, claiming the lives of several town residents. It had apparently been a dark spot in the town's history, with many families losing loved ones. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Had I just witnessed the souls of those lost in the accident, where they were tracing their steps, seeking closure, or merely reminding the living of their existence. I left the cemetery in a daze, my mind racing to make sense of what I'd witnessed. By the time I reached the gas station, dawn was breaking. The world around me started to stir, and the events of the night felt like a surreal dream. I never spoke about that night to anyone, fearing they'd dismiss it as a figment of my imagination or the result of exhaustion. But I knew what I'd seen the following night, and every night after, I listened intently for the sound of a train whistle at 2am. But it never came. Perhaps those souls had found their peace and had no reason to return. A year had passed since the uncanny incident at the gas station, and my life in the city had consumed most of my attention. The buzz of urban life, my new job, and the various adventures that come with Libby in a bustling metropolis had almost pushed the memories of that night to the farthest quarters of my mind. Almost, I was attending a work party when I met Eliza, a colleague's girlfriend. After the usual exchange of pleasantries, our conversation naturally steered towards our origins. To my surprise, Eliza hailed from a town neighboring my own. As we chatted about our shared love for the quiet countryside, the events of that fateful night resurfaced in my mind. Although I had been hesitant to share the story with anyone, something compelled me to confide in Eliza. As I recounted the story, her playful demeanor changed to one of deep thought. I could see a mixture of recognition and disbelief in her eyes. You might think I'm crazy, Eliza, but I swear every word is true, I concluded. She paused for a moment before responding, I don't think you're crazy. My grandmother once told me a similar tale, but in her version, it was my great-great-grandfather who was on that train. The chill went down my spine. Suddenly, my experience felt even more personal. She continued, He was traveling for work and was aboard that ill-fated train. She said he never came back home, but every year, on the anniversary of the accident, strange things would happen in their house. Doors would close by themselves, and sometimes, late at night, she'd hear the distant sound of a train whistle, even though no trains passed through our town anymore. The similarities in our stories were uncanny. Here was a connection to one of the very souls I might have seen that night. The thought was both comforting and eerie. I 
always thought she told me those stories to scare me or to make me sleep early, Eliza mused, but now, hearing your experience, I'm not so sure. The two of us sat a reflective silence for a while. That night, we forged a bond over shared histories and the mysteries that eluded our understanding. They felt comforting to have someone validate my experience, to know that I wasn't alone. Years passed, and Eliza became a close family friend. Our initial conversation about the spectral train led to many more discussions about our hometowns, family histories, and the unexplained mysteries that life often presents. Then, during one summer, Eliza invited me to visit her hometown. We decided to make a day trip of it, visiting old landmarks and recounting family tales. Our journey inevitably brought us to the site of the train accident. Now a memorial, the site had been preserved with plaques bearing the names of those who had perished. As I ran my fingers over the cold metal names, I felt a strange connection to these souls, a bond forged from that one inexplicable encounter. We paid our respects, and the weight of the moment stayed with us as we left the site. Later that evening, as Eliza and I sat on our porch, the soft summer breeze carrying the scent of blooming flowers, we heard it, a faint, distant train whistle. We exchanged a knowing look, acknowledging the mysteries that surrounded us, feeling humbled and connected in ways we couldn't quite put into words. While I never experienced another encounter like that night at the gas station, it remained a defining moment in my life. It was a reminder of the intricate tapestry of existence, of connections that transcend time, and of the profound mysteries that lie just beyond the realm of our understanding. For the sake of this story, you can call me Sarah. I'm a 28-year-old woman, and at the time of this incident, I was working as a late-night radio jockey in a city about an hour away from my home. As part of my job, I'd play requests, have friendly banter with night owls, or sometimes just load truckers trying to stay awake on their long hauls. The night this happened was like any other. I finished my show around 3 a.m., locked up the station, and headed to my car, parked in a small lot beside the building. My usual ritual was to play some soft tunes, get a coffee from the 24-hour joint down the road, and then start my drive home. About 20 minutes into my drive, I realized I'd forgotten my coffee. Great, I muttered to myself. I was on a highway, with the next possible stop nearly half an hour away. But then, my headlights caught a sign, Daisy's Diner, open 24-7. It was an exit I wasn't familiar with, but the promise of a warm coffee was too tempting. I took the exit. The diner was a quaint little place with a retro 60 seconds look, neon lights included. Porking my car, I quickly headed inside. There were a couple of truckers and a young couple at one of the booths. The waitress, a middle-aged woman with a friendly face, poured me a coffee. I decided to have it there rather than take it on the road. As I was sipping my drink, I noticed a man sitting at the counter. He was tall, wearing a rugged leather jacket and had a day stubble. He kept glancing my way. Initially, I brushed it off. Maybe he recognized my voice. Some listeners occasionally did. However, as I got up to leave, he did too. Alarm bells began to ring faintly in the back of my mind, but I pushed them away, telling myself I was being paranoid. Getting to to my car, I pulled out onto the highway and almost immediately noticed a pair of headlights behind me. They seemed to be tailing me a bit too closely for comfort. Every turn I took, the car followed me. That faint alarm in my head turned into a blaring siren. Desperate to confirm my suspicion, I took a sudden exit that led to a smaller town, hoping to lose him in the winding streets. But the car was still there, its headlights now even more aggressive. My mind raced. I remembered reading about not driving home if you suspect you're being followed. The last thing I wanted was for this guy, if he had ill intentions to know where I lived. Spotting a police station sign, relief washed over me. I sped up, and the car behind me did the same. We were now in a full-blown high-speed chase. My heart thudded loudly in my chest, each beat echoing the seconds I hoped separated me from safety. Skidding into the police station parking lot, I honked incessantly. The car that had been tailing me stopped at the entrance. I leave for a moment. Then, just as suddenly as it began, it reversed and sped away. Two officers came out, guns drawn. In. Breathless, I narrated the night's events. They took down the description of the car and said they patrol the area. One officer kindly offered to follow me home, ensuring I arrived safely. Once home, I double checked all my locks, barely getting any sleep that night. The next day, I got a call from the police. They found the car abandoned in a nearby town. Inside were ropes, duct tape, a knife, and chillingly photographs. Pictures of me at work, at the diner, and even from years ago. It became clear this wasn't a random act. The man had been stalking me for years, silently, patiently waiting for his moment. The police never did catch on. The aftermath of that terrifying night transformed my perspective on personal safety. I realized how lucky I'd been to escape the clutches of a determined stalker, and I made it my mission to prevent others from facing similar dangers. Two years after the incident, I founded a non-profit organization called Guarded Steps. Our mission was to raise awareness about stalking, its warning signs, and how to protect oneself. I became a spokesperson, sharing my story at universities, community centers, and seminars. My tale was a potent mix of vulnerability and caution 
teaching attendees about the nuances of stalking, both digital and physical. The support was overwhelming. Numerous individuals approached me, recounting their chilling encounters. I was horrified at the prevalence of stalking, but as the stories poured in, they also brought to light the strength and resilience of survivors. Elaine, a university student, spoke of how an ex-boyfriend turned into a vengeful stalker after she broke up with him. He'd send her threatening messages, follow her around campus, and even spread malicious rumors about her. With the help of guarded steps, she gathered evidence, got a restraining order, and he was eventually expelled from the university. There was also David, a middle-aged man, who explained how an obsessed co-worker planted tracking devices on his car. He was always paranoid, thinking someone was watching him. The discovery of the devices was accidental, but it provided the evidence needed to take legal action. He now advocates alongside me, reminding audiences that men could be victims too. The countless stories were a testament to the sinister side of human nature, but for every dark tale, there was a ray of hope. Through guarded steps, we established a helpline, support groups, and collaborated with law enforcement agencies to conduct safety workshops. One autumn evening, as I was wrapping up a workshop at a college campus, a woman approached me. Her face was vaguely familiar, but I couldn't quite place her. She introduced herself as Lucy, the waitress from Basie's Diner. She told me how that night had deeply disturbed her, and when she'd heard about my organization, she felt compelled to help. She was now one of our most active volunteers, channeling her distress into something positive. However, my my past wasn't entirely behind me. Every so often, there'd be subtle reminders of that terrifying chase. A shadow lurking a second too long, a random car parked near my home, or an unfamiliar number calling at odd hours. I'd report these occurrences, but they were sporadic and never led to any significant leads. My paranoia often made me wonder if he was still out there, watching, waiting, maybe plotting another sinister move. But I refused to let fear dictate my life. Five years into running guarded steps, on the anniversary of that fateful night, a package arrived at my office. It was a small box wrapped crudely in brown paper, no return address. Opening it cautiously, I found a single, faded photograph. It was a picture of me, taken during my radio jockey days, with the words never forgotten scribbled on the back. The chill returned, stronger than ever. I informed the police, and security measures around me were intensified. Yet, the sender remained a phantom. Despite these unsettling events, I drew strength from the community we'd built. They were my pillars, reminding me every day that while evil lurked in some corners, goodness and resilience thrived in many more. Life is a blend of light and shadow, and while my stalker might never be apprehended, I found solace in the knowledge that my experience had ignited a beacon for countless others, guiding them away from potential threats and towards a haven of support. To this day, as I gaze into my rearview mirror, I see not just the road behind but also the faces of those we've helped, the lives we've touched, and the journey that lies ahead. Into that shadow from my past, while we may never meet again, know that your actions, intended to instill fear, gave birth to a force of hope and empowerment. It was a late summer evening, and the sun had just slipped below the horizon. I was driving back from my friend Leela's place after a fun evening of board games that weighed too much pizza. We lived in adjacent towns, with a dense forest separating our homes. The main road that wound its way through the forest was the most commonly used route, but there was a lesser known, older road that cut through the middle known to locals as Miller's Path. Rumor had it the road was named after Old Man Miller, who lived in the forest decades ago but had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Leela, ever the fan of spicing things up, up, challenged me to take the old road. It'll shave 10 minutes off your trip, she winked teasingly. I wasn't superstitious, and the promise of getting home sooner was appealing, so I decided to take the Miller's path. Almost immediately, I noticed how unkempt the road was. Overgrown bushes scratched the sides of my car. Tall trees on either side formed a canopy, making it darker than I'd anticipated. The road was barely wide enough for one vehicle, so I hoped I wouldn't encounter another car coming from the opposite direction. About halfway through, the dense forest opened up to a small clearing on the left, where the skeletal remains of what must have once been a house stood. This had to be Miller's old residence. I couldn't resist the urge to stop and take a quick look. As I got out of the car, I was greeted by an eerie silence. No birds, no wind, just an oppressive stillness. I approached the dilapidated house with caution. It was mostly wooden, with parts of it charred, suggesting there had been a fire long ago. I could make out remnants of furniture inside. Curiosity peaked. I ventured further in, my phone flashlight leading the way. As I inspected the ruins, a chill ran 
ran down my spine. Among the charred remains, I found a scorched photo frame. Wiping away the soot, I saw a black and white picture of a man, presumably Miller, with piercing eyes that seemed to stare right through me. Suddenly, the stillness was broken by a soft, barely audible whisper, leaf. I jolted, my heart racing. I flashed my light around, but there was no one. The rational part of my brain reasoned it must be the wind playing tricks, but deep down, I felt an unsettling feeling. I hurried back to my car, eager to get back on the road. As I started the engine and pulled away, my headlights illuminated a figure standing by the ruins. A tall man, reminiscent of the figure in the photo, with those same piercing eyes. He was there for just a split second, and then the darkness swallowed him. Shaken, I pressed the accelerator harder. I wanted to be out of the forest and on familiar roads, but fate had other plans. The car's radio suddenly came to life, blaring static. The signal in the forest was always spotty, but this was different. Amidst the static, I heard a voice, the same whisper from earlier, why did you come here? Panicking, I tried changing stations, turning off the radio, but it wouldn't budge. It was stuck on the eerie static and now repeating voice. That's when things went from bad to worse. My car's headlights started flickering, and within moments, I was engulfed in absolute darkness, save for the pale moonlight filtering through the trees. I slammed on the brakes, my breath ragged. I reached for my phone, intending to call for help, but it was dead. No, 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 I muttered. My initial skepticism had transformed into genuine fear. I remembered an old trick my dad taught me about car lights. Sometimes, giving the fuse box a good tap can jostle things back to life. I reluctantly stepped out and popped the hood. A few taps later, to my immense relief, the headlights flickered back on. But as I dropped the hood and turned around, I froze. There, standing a few feet from me in the middle of the road, was the figure from the ruins. It was unmistakably the visage of Old Man Miller. He slowly began walking towards me. Each step seemed deliberate, echoing in the silence. Without thinking, I jumped into the car, locked the doors, and sped off. Miller, or whatever that figure was, didn't chase me. But the feeling of being watched never left. The rest of the drive felt endless, the trees seemed to close in, and the whispers grew louder, surrounding me in a cacophony of voices. But as soon as I saw the end of Miller's path and the junction to the main road, everything returned to normal. The radio went silent, and the oppressive feeling lifted. I reached home, my body shaking and mind reeling from the experience. My parents saw my distressed state and, after hearing my story, firmly admonished me for taking the old road, especially at night. The next day, I visited the local library. An elderly librarian named Miss Agatha, known to be a treasure trove of local history, recounted the legend of Miller's path. Apparently, old man Miller had been accused of practicing dark arts. One night, his house mysteriously caught fire. When locals went to investigate, they found the house in ruins but no sign of Miller. From then on, people reported strange sightings and occurrences, especially on moonlit nights. It became an unspoken rule in town to avoid the path after dark. In the months that followed, my night on Miller's path became something of a local legend itself. Friends would introduce me to strangers as the guy who survived the Miller curse. While most people in town took the story with a grain of salt, I became something of an unwilling local celebrity. I found myself telling the story over and over, each time reliving the terror of that moonlit night. Some people were genuinely curious, others looked at me with skepticism, and a few even dared me to drive the path with them, eager for a first-hand experience. But I always refused. No amount of prodding or money could make me set foot on that accursed road after dark again. One evening, a year after the incident, Leela and invited me to another game night. I hesitated but decided to go, ensuring I'd leave well before sunset. However, time flew, and once again, I found myself driving home late. But this time, I was adamant about taking the main road. As I drove, an unsettling feeling crept over me. The familiarity of the surroundings struck me, and with a sinking realization, I noticed the dilapidated entrance to Miller's Path. Somehow, in my fatigue or out of force of habit, I had turned onto the cursed road. The moonlight, as if mocking me, brightly illuminated the surroundings. My pulse quickened, and I debated turning the car around. But the road was narrow, and maneuvering would be a challenge. The quickest way out was straight ahead. I pressed on, every sound from the forest magnifying my anxiety. Suddenly, the familiar static returned to the radio. The whispers, soft at first, grew louder and more distinct. You're back, they hissed. Up ahead, in the moonlit distance, I could see the ruins of Miller's house. And sure enough, the silhouette of the tall figure stood by the roadside. I floored the gas pedal, hoping to race past without stopping. But as I neared, the figure stepped onto the road, forcing me to swerve to avoid a collision. The car skidded off the road, crashing into a tree. My head slammed against the steering wheel, and darkness consumed me. When I came to, it was still night. My head throbbed, and my arm ached from the impact. The car's headlights were out, but the pale moonlight provided just enough illumination. I could make out the figure standing a few meters away, watching. Suddenly, another car's headlights lit up the scene. A voice shouted, Hey, are you alright? It was Mr. Thompson, a local farmer who lived nearby and used the road early mornings to get to the town market.
market. He rushed to my side, concern evident on his face, seeing him seem to disperse whatever dark force was at play. The eerie whispers faded, and the figure by Miller's ruins vanished. Mr. Thompson helped me out of the wrecked car and took me to the local hospital. Thankfully, I'd escaped with just a mild concussion and a fractured arm. When I recounted the events to him, he nodded gravely. Many of us know better than to use that road at night, he said. But every now and then, someone either forgets or doesn't believe. You're lucky to have come out alive twice. News of my second encounter with Miller's path spread through town like wildfire. While I had been a bit of a celebrity before, this time, I became a legend. The guy who braved Miller's path twice and lived to tell the tale. The local council, taking note of the danger, officially closed off Miller's path soon after my accident. It was deemed unsafe due to its narrow structure and lack of maintenance, but many locals whispered it was to keep others from meeting Miller. Years passed, and life moved on, but the legend of Miller's path never faded. While I no longer lived in that town, every time I visited, I'd find myself narrating the tale to a new generation of eager listeners, passing on the cautionary tale of the haunted road in the woods. And as for me, the events of those nights left a mark. While the physical injuries healed, the psychological ones lingered. I developed an aversion to moonlit nights and stayed far away from wooded roads. But over time, with therapy and the support of loved ones, I learned to cope. Yet, the memory of those piercing eyes, the whispers, and the overwhelming sense of dread will forever be etched in my mind. And while I have many adventures and stories from my life, the tale of Miller's path remains the most chilling, a stark reminder of the unseen, inexplicable forces that might exist just beyond the periphery of our understanding. It was a cold winter evening, the kind where your breath fogs up in front of you. I had just finished a late shift at work and was making my way to the subway station. Working in the city but living on the outskirts had its advantages, like cheaper rent, but it meant a longer commute, especially when I had the closing shift. The streets were almost deserted, with only a few late night establishments still open. The neon lights from a nearby diner flickered, giving the street a sort of war film aesthetic. I quickened my pace, eager to get home and into my warm bed. When I reached the subway station, it was almost deserted. Just a few scattered souls waiting for the last train of the night. I took a seat on one of the cold metal benches and plugged in my earphones, hoping some music would keep the fatigue at bay. A few minutes had passed when I felt it, that prickling sensation on the back of your neck when you feel someone's eyes on you. I glanced around, trying to spot the source. That's when I noticed him. Across the platform, a man was seated on a bench directly opposite mine. He was average looking, with a scruffy beard and dressed in a weathered coat and hat, but his gaze was fixed intently on me, trying to give him the benefit of the out, I thought maybe he was just lost in thought and looking in my general direction. I shifted in my seat and focused my attention back on my phone. A few more songs played, but the feeling persisted. I risked another glance, and sure enough, he was still staring. This time, when our eyes met, he smiled. Not a friendly, casual smile, but a slow, deliberate one that made my skin crawl. I decided to move to the other end of the platform. Maybe he'd get the hint. As I settled into another seat, I discreetly observed him. To my dismay, after a moment, he got up and started walking in my direction. His pace was casual, but there was a determination in his steps. Panic started to creep in. I told myself I was being paranoid, but every instinct was screaming that something was off. I considered leaving the station and calling a cab, but I hadn't brought much money with me, and my place was a good distance away. Just then, an announcement echoed through the station. The last train would be arriving shortly. Relief washed over me. I just had to get on the train and make sure I sat near other people. The train's lights became visible, and the sound of it approaching grew louder. As the doors opened, Opened, I quickly stepped inside and chose a seat between two groups of people, hoping to blend in. The man entered the same compartment. He scanned the area, his gaze landing on me once more. Then, he took a seat a few rows behind me. I could feel his eyes on me. The train started moving, and the dim lights of the subway tunnel passed by in a blur. My mind raced, trying to think of what to do. I didn't want to lead this man to my home. I considered getting off at a random stop, but the thought of being stranded in an unfamiliar area at this hour wasn't appealing either. As the train neared my stop, I I devised a plan. I'd wait until the last second, then exit the train quickly. Hopefully, he wouldn't have enough time to react and follow. When my stop was announced, I remained seated, pretending to be engrossed in my phone. As the train slowed, I tensed, ready to make my move. Just as the doors were about to close, I bolted out, nearly tripping in my haste. Breathing heavily, I watched from the platform as the train pulled away. To my horror, the man was at the window, staring down at me, his face twisted in anger. He had tried to follow but hadn't been quick enough. I didn't wait around. 
I sprinted up the stairs and out of the station, not stopping until I reached the safety of my apartment building. Once inside, I double locked my door and collapsed on the couch, the adrenaline slowly leaving my system. The next day, I reported the incident to the transit police. They took my statement and promised to review the security footage. A few days later, an officer contacted me. They had identified the man. He had a history of stalking and had several restraining orders against him. They hadn't been able to locate him yet, but assured me they were doing everything they could. I didn't take the subway for a long time after that. My encounter served as a chilly reminder that danger could lurk around any corner, even in the most mundane settings. In the weeks that followed, I enrolled in a self-defense class, a decision stemmed me both from my own harrowing experience and the advice of a close friend who believed it would help rebuild my confidence. The class was empowering. Each session chipped away at the fear that had settled deep inside me, replacing it with a newfound strength. One evening, after a particularly grueling workout, I sat down at a coffee shop next to the gym. As I sipped on my drink, I was approached by a woman with familiar, grateful eyes. Fi, she began hesitantly. You don't know me, but I owe you a great deal. The man who stalked you dot 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 he had been following me for weeks prior. It was your testimony and evidence that finally got the police involved enough to catch him. Her name was Elise. We sat and talked for hours, bonding over her shared trauma. It turned out she lived just a few blocks away from me. Our paths had probably crossed numerous times, but it took this dark twist of fate to truly connect us. Together, Elise and I formed a support group for individuals who had experienced stalking or any form of harassment. We named it Safe Spaces, a community to share, heal, and empower. Our group met once a week, and with each session, our numbers grew. People from all walks of life came forward with their stories, finding solace in the understanding and empathy of others. One evening, a detective from the local police department attended one of our sessions. He introduced himself as Detective Martinez and explained that he had been working closely on cases related to stalking and personal harassment. He offered his expertise and insights to the group, which proved invaluable. Our little community became a bridge between victims and the law enforcement system, facilitating better understanding and cooperation. The years passed, and what began as a small support group eventually evolved into a non-profit organization. We organized workshops, partnered with other community outreach programs, and even influenced the local council to push for stricter laws against stalkers. As for me, life had come full circle. From a terrified victim, I had become a beacon of hope for others. Elise and I became best friends, and together, we channeled our pain into a force for positive change. Yet, I never forgot that cold winter evening at the subway station. The memory served as a constant reminder of both my vulnerability and my strength. It was a testament to the human spirit's resilience, our innate ability to rise above adversity, and our capacity to transform pain into purpose. late nights at the office had become the norm for me. As a software developer knee-deep in the launch phase of our newest product, leaving at odd hours was something I had grown accustomed to. However, on this particular evening, I'd stayed even later than usual. By the time I headed out, it was past midnight. Driving on the long stretch of highway that connected my workplace to home was therapeutic. But tonight, with the pitch darkness and fewer cars, there was an eerie sense of isolation. A dense fog was beginning to roll in, reducing visibility to almost zero. I drove cautiously, the fog swallowing up the road behind me. Around halfway to my destination, hunger pangs hit. I remembered a 24-7 roadside diner I passed countless times but had never tried. Considering the fog and my hunger, it seemed like a good place to take a short break. When I arrived, the diner, with its neon open sign, was a welcome sight amidst the encompassing grayness. Parking my car, I noticed only a couple of other vehicles in the lot, an old rusted pickup and a sleek motorcycle. Inside, the diner had an old-fashioned charm. There were red booths lining the walls, stools along the counter, and soft rock playing in the background. I chose a booth by the window, from where I could keep an eye on my car. A tired-looking waitress came over, handed me a menu, and poured coffee without asking, probably used to late-night customers needing a caffeine boost. Gratefully, I took a sip and decided on a quick sandwich. The place had two other patrons, a rough-looking guy with a leather jacket at the counter, presumably the motorcyclist, and a man in one of the booths with a trucker hat, deeply engrossed in a newspaper. I surmised he belonged to the rusty pickup outside. I received my order in record time, probably because I was one of the few customers. As I ate, I couldn't help but overhear snippets of the conversation between the waitress and the guy in the leather jacket. They talked in hushed tones, but the silence of the diner amplified their words. Found another one last week. He was saying. The waitress responded, her voice quivering, it's been too close for comfort. Jack 
Jack, what if he heads here next? I've been keeping an ear out, trying to track him down. Jack replied, my ears perked up. Were they talking about some local criminal? My gaze inadvertently shifted to them. The guy, Jack, caught my stare and gave me a sharp look. I quickly diverted my attention, but the tension in the air was palpable. I finished my meal and decided to leave a generous tip, eager to get out. But just as I was about to exit, the trucker guy stood up, blocking my path. Bad fog out there, he remarked, his voice deep and gravelly. Yeah, hoping to get home before it gets worse, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. He tilted his head, observing me closely. You be careful out there, city boy. Roads here can be treacherous, especially with the fog, and not just because of poor visibility. I nodded, thanked him for the advice, and quickly made my way to my car. The cold air outside did little to alleviate the unease that the trucker's cryptic warning had instilled in me. Driving out of the parking lot, I noticed the motorcycle guy, Jack, following suit. Alarm bells rang in my head. Was I being paranoid, or was this guy following me? As I merged onto the highway, he kept a consistent distance behind me. Every turn I took, he mirrored in the fog, which had thickened, coupled with the haunting shadows of trees lining the road. Added to my growing sense of dread, recalling the trucker's warning, I decided to test my suspicion. I took a sudden turn onto a smaller road, one that led to a nearby town. To my dismay, the motorcycle's headlights followed. Panicking now, I pushed the accelerator, hoping to outrun him. The road ahead was unfamiliar, winding and narrow. In the dense fog, every curve was a blind spot, every hill concealed the road beyond, but fear was a potent motivator and I was desperate to lose him. Suddenly, as I came over a rise, my headlights illuminated a figure standing right in the middle of the road. I swerved, narrowly missing the person, and my car skidded into a ditch. Dazed from the impact, I took a moment to gather myself. The fog outside enveloped everything. Then, a knock on the window jolted me. He was the trucker from the diner. Looks like you've got yourself in a tight spot, he said, his voice muffled by the glass. Before I could respond, another figure approached. It was Jack. My heart raced, but the trucker stepped between us, holding out a hand to stop him. Enough, Jack. He bellowed. The kids had enough. To my astonishment, Jack halted, looking sheepish. I. I thought he overheard us, Jack mumbled, pointing towards the diner in the distance. The trucker sighed. He's not involved. And even if he did hear something, it's our mess to clean up, not his. I sat there, confusion replacing my fear. The trucker gestured to Jack, who reluctantly pulled out a tow rope from his motorcycle's side bag. Together, they managed to pull my car out of the ditch. Once back on the road, the trucker approached my window. Sorry about the scare, kid. We're not what you think. We've been tracking a local troublemaker. Thought maybe he'd made you a target. Jack here got a bit too carried away. I was at a loss for words. So dot dot dot, you were trying to protect me. In a matter of speaking, yes, the trucker replied. You take care now, and maybe avoid late night diner stops for a while. As I drove away, the adrenaline began to wear off, replaced by a surreal sense of disbelief. What had started as a simple meal break had turned into the most bizarre night of my life. The next day at work, bleary eye from lack of sleep, I recounted the night's events to my colleague, Lisa. Her eyes widened in disbelief as I narrated each twist and turn. No way, that's something straight out of a horror movie, she exclaimed once I'd finished. I gave a weary nod. I know, part of me is still convinced it was some elaborate dream. She leaned in, her curiosity peaked. You said this happened near the old diner on Route 16. Yeah, why? Lisa hesitated, biting her lip. There have been rumors. Some folks say that there's an underground criminal ring operating in the area. Smuggling, drugs, that sort of thing. The diner is supposedly a front for their activities. My heart rate quickened. You think the trucker and the biker were part of it? She shrugged. It's possible. But then again, it could just be a wild rumor. Small towns and their stories, you know. The idea gnawed at me. The overheard conversation in the diner. The chase. The cryptic comments. It all started to fit into this dark narrative. I decided I had to find out more. The journalist in me, though buried under layers of code and software lingo, stirred to life. Over the next few weeks, during my free time, I delved into local news archives and online forums, piecing together snippets of information. There were a few unexplained disappearances in the area, some reports of increased drug activity, and vague mentions of a biker gang. One evening, as I was deep into a forum thread, a private message notification popped up. The user was someone named Shadow Seeker. The message read, I've seen your posts. Looking into the diner, are we? Be careful. Some secrets are better left in the dark. Chills ran down my spine, but instead of deterring me, the message only piqued my curiosity further. I replied, trying to keep my tone neutral, just trying to understand what happened that night. Any info you could provide. There was a long pause before the reply came in. Meet me at the public library tomorrow, 3 p.m. North Radian Roma. The next day, with a mixture of anxiety and anticipation, I arrived at the designated location. I spotted a figure in the back corner, a hood obscuring their face. As I approached, the figure looked up, revealing the familiar face of Lisa. Lisa, I exclaimed, 
in disbelief. Your shadow seeker. She gave a sheepish smile. Hilti, look, I wanted to help but wasn't sure how involved you wanted to get. Why didn't you just tell me? I asked, still in shock. I was trying to protect you. She replied, but when I saw how deep you were digging, I knew I had to step in. I've lived here all my life and I have some connections. We spent hours discussing what she knew. While some of the rumors were exaggerated, the diner was indeed a hot spot for unsavory activities. The trucker, it seemed, was a sort of vigilante trying to disrupt the criminal's operations. Jack, the biker, was his reluctant ally, a former member of a local gang seeking redemption. With Lisa's information and my first-hand experience, we approached the local authorities. It took time and a few close calls with some less than friendly individuals, but eventually a major sting operation was conducted. The diner was shut down and several key figures were arrested, significantly disrupting the criminal activities in the area. The trucker, whose real name was Mike, and Jack became local heroes, their previous actions now seen in a new light. As for Lisa and me, our bond grew stronger. From colleagues, we became partners in an investigation, often diving into local mysteries and urban legends. Our little adventures brought excitement to our otherwise mundane routines. With that diner, even years later, it remained a haunting reminder of the night when my life took an unexpected turn, a place I drove past but never dared to stop it again. Back in college, I'd take long walks around campus in town well past midnight, earbuds in, lost in my music and thoughts. When I moved to the city for a job, my nocturnal strolls continued. At the age of 25, I found myself in a small but cozy apartment in the heart of the city. My neighbor, an elderly woman named Mrs. Gallagher, had a rather rambunctious golden retriever named Charlie. Due to her age and her late husband's recent passing, she struggled to give Charlie his needed exercise. One evening, she asked if I could walk Charlie during my nocturnal excursions. I was more than happy to oblige. Charlie was energetic but gentle, and we quickly became pals. On a brisk autumn night, as the trees cast eerie shadows onto the dimly lit sidewalks and a slight mist hung in the air, Charlie and I ventured out. The city's nocturnal life buzzed around us, taxis zipping by, the distant laughter from late night bars, and the subtle hum of streetlights. About 20 minutes into our walk, I decided to pass through a park known as Maple Gardens. While it was a beautiful place during the day with families and children playing, at night, it took on a more serene, albeit summer, at Atmosphere. A thick canopy of trees made it darker than the streets, but the path was relatively straight and led directly to the other side of the park, so I wasn't too concerned. As Charlie and I walked deeper into the park, my playlist shifted to a mellower tune. I lowered the volume, allowing the natural sounds of the night to merge with my music. Charlie, usually eager and sniffing around, suddenly stopped in his tracks, ears perked, and tail stiff. I paused, pulling out an earbud. In the distance, I could see a silhouette of a man standing still, facing us. He was too far to make out any distinction distinct features, but something about his stance fell dot 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 off. I hesitated for a moment, gauging whether to turn around or continue forward. But city living had made me a bit defiant and overconfident, so I tightened my grip on Charlie's leash and continued, albeit at a brisker pace. However, with each step I took, the man started mirroring my movements. When I walked, he walked. When I stopped, he stopped. A cold unease settled in my gut. I decided to test my suspicions by taking an abrupt turn onto a smaller pathway to the left. After a few steps, I glanced back. He had followed. Panic surged through me. I grabbed my phone, ready to dial 911, when suddenly Charlie growled, a deep, warning growl I'd never heard him make. I turned to see another figure emerging from the tree line to our right. This one was closer, and I could make out a scruffy beard and dark, piercing eyes that seemed to gleam in the minimal light. I was trapped. Thinking quickly, I remembered an old tactic I'd read about. I shouted loudly into the apparent void, Hey, yeah, I see you. I'm by the south entrance of Maple Gardens. Furry up. Both figures paused momentarily likely weighing the possibility of someone coming to my aid. Using the momentary distraction, I took off at a full sprint, pulling Charlie along. To my surprise, Charlie seemed to understand the gravity of the situation and ran with fervor, his powerful strides aiding our escape. After what felt like an eternity, we reached the well-lit main road. I chanced to look back and, to my relief, saw no one in pursuit. Gasping for breath, I called the police. Within minutes, a patrol car arrived. I described the two men, and they began a search of the park. The next day, an officer visited my apartment to update me. They'd found a makeshift camp in the park, likely belonging to the two men. Among the possessions were ropes, tape, and a few sharp tools. The implication sent shivers down my spine. The men themselves were nowhere to be found, but the police assured me they'd increase patrols in the area. Mrs. Gallagher, having heard about the incident, was horrified. She thanked me profusely for protecting Charlie and insisted on hiring a professional dog walker for the evenings, though I continued to walk him during daylight hours. The incident was a brutal wake-up call. 
world. I realized that the invincible feeling of city living had its limits. My nocturnal walk ceased, replaced by daytime jogs. I also enrolled in a self-defense class and always ensured someone knew my whereabouts when heading out. Several months passed without incident. However, one evening, as I returned from work, Mrs. Gallagher was waiting for me. She looked shaken. In her hand was a crumpled note that had been slipped under her door. It read, You got lucky with the dog. Next time, maybe not. Weeks turned into months, and my life settled into a new rhythm in the different part of the city. My apartment was on a higher floor in a secure building, complete with a doorman, and I felt safe. However, memories of that harrowing night in the park lingered. To cope, I started attending group therapy sessions for people who had experienced trauma traumatic events. It was here that I met Emily, a petite brunette with a fiery spirit. She had been through a stalking incident herself and understood the anxiety that followed such an ordeal. Emily and I bonded over our shared experiences and soon became close friends. She introduced me to a world of self-awareness and advocacy. We joined volunteer groups, educating women on self-defense and situational awareness. One evening after one of our workshops, as we sipped coffee in a quaint little cafe, Emily's face turned serious. Have you ever thought of confronting your past? Maybe go back to that park. I recoiled at the suggestion. Why would I? It's all behind me. She gently placed her hand over mine. Sometimes, facing our fears head on can be therapeutic. Closure, you know. The idea was daunting, but after some contemplation, I decided that maybe she was right. With Emily by my side for support, I planned a daytime visit to Maple Gardens. The day was sunny and bright, children laughing on swings, joggers pacing themselves on familiar trails. The very path that once spelled danger for me was now just a winding strip of gravel. We walked, tracing the steps of that night, right up to the spot where I'd first seen the menacing silhouette. Surprisingly, I felt empowered. The shadows that once loomed large were now just trees. The fear I'd been replaced with resilience. On our way out of the park, a police officer recognized me. Hey, you're the lady from that night, right? With the dog. I nodded, surprised he remembered. He continued, just wanted you to know, we caught one of those guys a few weeks back. He's been late to multiple muggings in the area. Relief washed over me. Thank you, officer, for updating me. As Emily and I left Maple Gardens, I felt the weight lifting off my shoulders. Confronting my past, though challenging, had been the right decision. Years rolled on, and Emily and I started in a go focused on empowering women and providing them with resources post-traumatic events. My once fearful narrative became a beacon of hope for many. And Charlie, I visit him occasionally at Mrs. Gallagher's daughter's place. Our bond remained unshaken. As time wore on and his golden fur turned gray, his loyalty and bravery were constants, reminding me always of the night that changed everything. And the dog who stood by my side. For all the darkness that one night brought into my life, it also ushered in light, resilience, friendship, and purpose. It was a testament to the human spirit's ability to heal, grow, and transform even the most traumatic experiences into powerful lessons. Moving to a new town is never easy, especially when it's a small one. Everyone knows everyone, and newcomers stand out like a sore thumb. When I took a job in a little town called Morton, about 500 miles away from the hustle and bustle of the city I was used to, I anticipated the challenge. The town was picturesque, quaint houses, manicured lawns, and streets so clean you could almost see your reflection in them. People were polite, often greeting you with a nod or a smile. Within weeks, I had settled into my rented home, a lovely two-bedroom house on Elm Street. One night, as I was wrapping up work in my home office, my landline rang. I found it odd since very few people had that number. Hello. I answered, silence, and then a soft exhale. Who's this? I pressed, click. They hung up. Probably a wrong number, I thought, and returned to my work. But half an hour later, the phone rang again. I picked it up immediately. Hello. Silence again. But this time, I could hear faint breathing on the other end. This isn't funny, I said, annoyance clear in my voice. Click. Over the next week, the silent calls continued, always after sunset. Always the same pattern, silence, breathing, then a hang-up. I tried calling the number back, but it always went to a generic voicemail. Frustrated, I contacted the local phone company. They said they'd look into it, but the calls persisted, and they became more frequent, sometimes happening five minutes, six times a night. One evening, I decided to confront the caller. What do you want? Why are you doing this? For the first time, there was a response. A low chuckle, then, you shouldn't have come here. Chills ran down my spine. The voice was distorted, making it hard to determine if it it was a man or a woman. The following morning, I went to the police. They were initially dismissive, attributing it to some local kids playing pranks. But when I mentioned the message, they grew more concerned. They promised to trace the call 
else. That night, I sat in my living room, waiting. The phone rang, and I braced myself. The voice came again. You really should leave before it's too late. Terrified, I asked, who are you? The reply said to shiver down my spine. Someone who watches, someone close. I immediately checked all the locks on my doors and windows and drew the curtains. The police were informed, but they hadn't made any progress in tracing the call. One evening, as I was watching TV, trying to distract myself, there was a knock on the window. Peering through the curtains, I saw nothing. Just as I was about to brush it off, another knock came, this time from the back door. My heart pounded in my chest. I picked up the landline, ready to call the police, but there was no dial tone. The line was dead. I grabbed my cell phone, but it showed no signal. Suddenly, the power went out, plunging the house into darkness. My panic grew. I stumbled, trying to find my way to the front door. But then, I heard it, the soft creak of the back door slowly opening. I bolted to my bedroom, locking it behind me and hiding in the closet. As I waited, trying to control my breathing, footsteps echoed in the silence of the house. The door to my bedroom creaked open. I know you're here. The distorted voice was burnt. It sounded even more menacing in person. Moments felt like hours, but then the sound of sirens pierced the night. The footsteps hastened, and the back door slammed. The police had arrived just in time. A neighbor had seen a figure lurking around my property and called them. As they conducted a search, they found my phone lines had been cut and a signal jammer was placed near my window, disrupting my cell service. Over the next week, an investigation unfolded. The culprit turned out to be none other than the town's phone technician, a man named Robert. He had an obsession with newcomers and had harassed several in the past, deriving pleasure from their fear. However, no one had ever reported him, scared of the tight-knit community's repercussions. I decided to break the cycle. With the evidence stacked against him and my testimony, Robert was convicted and imprisoned. The town, initially hesitant, began to rally around me, condemning Robert's actions. But the ordeal left its scars. I started a support group for those who had been harassed, allowing many to share their stories and heal. As for me, I moved back to the city, craving the anonymity it provided. The small town charm had lost its appeal. However, my experience served as a reminder that danger could lurk anywhere, even in the most picturesque settings. In the city, my life resumed a sense of normalcy. The tall buildings and buzzing crowds provided a stark contrast to the quiet serenity of Morton. Though I returned to the concrete jungle, the shadows of that traumatic period stayed with me, prompting me to take some proactive steps. One of the first things I did was enroll in a self-defense class. It was empowering. The classes not only taught me techniques to protect myself, but also helped rebuild the confidence that had been shattered. Through these sessions, I met others who had faced similar threats in various capacities, from mugging attempts to aggressive confrontations. Together, we formed a tight-knit group, relying on each other for emotional support and strength. Sarah, a fiery woman with raven black hair and a spirit to match, became one of my closest allies. She had faced a home intrusion once and had managed to fend off her attacker. Together, we brainstormed an idea to set up a community initiative that educated city dwellers about the importance of personal safety. Our initiative, named Guardian Watch, aimed to conduct workshops, self-defense classes, and awareness campaigns. We collaborated with local police stations, using their expertise to demonstrate the importance of vigilance in daily life. We started small, organizing sessions in community halls, schools, and offices. The feedback was overwhelmingly positive, and soon we were getting requests from various parts of the city. One day, as I was addressing a group of college students, a familiar face caught my eye. It was Emily, my support and confidante from Wharton. She had moved to the city for a fresh start, and seeing her at the audience, nodding in agreement and cheering me on, was the reassurance I didn't know I needed. After the workshop, we embraced the familiarity of her presence warming my heart. She expressed how proud she was of the initiative I'd undertaken. Emily joined Guardian Watch and, with her insights and dedication, our programs reached new heights. Months turned into years, and Guardian Watch grew beyond our wildest expectations. We had chapters in multiple cities, and our message of personal safety and empowerment reached thousands. We started a helpline for individuals who had faced any threats ensuring they got the necessary legal and psychological support. Through all of this, I found healing. Confronting my fears and turning them into an empowering movement was cathartic. Every person we helped, every life we impacted, added a piece to my healing puzzle. One summer evening, as I stood on my apartment balcony overlooking the sprawling city, Sarah joined me with two cups of tea. Look at what we've built, she whispered, her eyes reflecting the city lights. I couldn't have done it without you, I replied, holding up my cup for a toast. To resilience, she said, to new beginnings. I added, we both sipped our tea, the warmth of the beverage echoing the warmth in our hearts. The horrors of that period and Morton seemed distant, yet the lessons it taught me remained. I had learned the value of community, the importance of resilience, and the sheer power of turning negative experiences into positive action. The city lights blinked below, a testament to life moving forward, and I was ready for whatever came next. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If
if you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.